lovely April morning before it gets, before Delhi's temperature goes in the wrong direction. It's good that we are meeting here today to discuss a very interesting ongoing project of the Institute of China Studies. We have Ambassador Nalin Suri with us. We have, of course, Ambassador Ashokan, the Director of the Institute of Chinese Studies, and so many other people. It will be a pleasure as a to welcome you. The China presence in Africa, the very significant presence, going back, of course, to the famous railway line of the 1970s, the Tanzania-Zambia line. But, of course, that was a very different ball game, and now it's completely different. And rather than getting uh, reacting one way or the other, it's always better to look at it from the point of view of a good researcher, looking at different aspects, what are the pluses, what are the costs, what are the, you know, the full range of activities, and the full range of effects, intended and unintended effects. And I think that when I look at the list of people, and more important, the thing that they're looking at, the summary of the draft paper that has been prepared by the ICS, it does look that it has been really looked at across the full spectrum it has been looking at. At Nehru Memorial, our job is, we have, of course, our own fellows here. A full strength will be at 35 fellows here, between senior fellows, fellows, and junior fellows. In addition, of course, we are a platform for research. Anybody wanting to do research on contemporary affairs, contemporary India, etc., is always welcome here, and they do. A lot of people do come here. In fact, it's rare that we have a book written on contemporary India specifically, that the researcher, whoever she is, whoever he is, from anywhere in the world, has not consulted our archives at some point or the other, or our other records, as Janice's example. Increasingly, we are now, for the last few years, focusing a little more on international affairs and issues to do with the world outside India directly. But of course, nothing is outside in the sense that you are so interlinked to the world. If you look at our trade to GDP ratio, our trade to GDP ratio is higher than China's trade to GDP ratio. As also a function, of course, the fact that the GDP is much smaller. Numbers always can be misread. But still, we are very well linked to the world, and therefore, looking at effects of what's happening in the rest of the world, definitely these have an impact on India. And we've been encouraging such a collaborating it and also hosting events on this day. I will not take more time, but I'll just say that it gives us at the memorial great pleasure to work with or support in our own little way, very little way, just the premises, nothing very much. But at least in this little way the ISS's effort in studying China's Africa in engagement and Indian perspective. With this let me of course request you to switch off your uh, mobile phones, because I'm sure for most researchers there's nothing very urgent that can't wait for the next few hours. But leaving that aside, let me now request our Chair, Ambassador Nalin Suri, Distinguished Fellow of the Delhi Policy Group, to deliver his inaugural remarks. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Shakti, and thank you, Ashok, for inviting me for this very important roundtable discussion important essentially because we have uh, a team of excellent researchers who've done a fine piece of work on empirical work, on the ground work, on Chinese investments in two critical countries, Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, I think the reason why this work is important is not simply because of uh, an effort to assess what the Chinese have been doing in East Africa, but also to learn lessons for our own experiences. I mean, we are equally large aid and development partners for Africa. If you actually look at the statistics in terms of uh, pro data, then you'll find that India is not far behind China, whether in trade terms or in investment terms. <coughs> the difference is Chinese investments are much more in the face. They are big infrastructure projects. But we are also now in the business of doing big infrastructure projects in China. So I think the lessons that you've learned would apply as much to Indian investments if you leave the data aspect out of it. So I think from that perspective, it's very important that this work has been done. And I'm 
Only a little disappointed that people from either CII, FIKI, and the Ministry of External Affairs are not here. At least I didn't see them in the list. Because, uh, you know, these are lessons which would be very relevant for DPA and MEA. They're extremely relevant for CII because, as you know, CII has been doing with Africa since 2000. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah okay. Because CII has been doing in collaboration with MEA and Ministry of Commerce and now Exim Bank since 2005 an annual meeting with African leaders and African business. And this has grown over the years and is actually a very successful way of doing business with Africa and with the African countries. CIA also does three or four regional meetings in Africa every year. So I think the outcome of your uh, work should also be disseminated to them. Uh, maybe you can make a special presentation. It's also re relevant for the DPA of MEA. Uh, and I think it will this kind of work, if you actually do a couple of such projects in West Africa also, will help Ministry of External Affairs prepare the next summit, the fourth India-Africa Forum summit in that sense better. Now, I'm not going to, as I said to Veda earlier when we started, I'm not going to make comments on your outcome of your discussions <clears throat> in the beginning. Uh, I'd only want to make one general remark, and that is that a lot of the downsides of Chinese involvement in Africa, whether it be in trade or other terms, a lot of it has already been taken on board by the Chinese. And this is reflected very clearly in the outcome of FOCAC 20, 2018, which happened last year in September. If you study the documents of FOCAC, you'll find a conscious effort by the Chinese to address the very major downsides of their partnership with Africa. There again, there are lessons to be learned by us. The fundamental difference is that most of Indian investments in Africa are private sector oriented. And most government money is, is loans through Exim Bank, but for projects which are identified by our African partners. We do no projects in Africa which we want to do because we want to exploit any particular aspect of any particular African economy. I think that's the fundamental difference. But it's a learning process for us. It's a learning process for the Chinese. And I think it would be a mistake to think that the Chinese are not learning from their mistakes. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave my opening remarks for that, but to congratulate uh, ICS and the team led by Veda, I think, for doing an outstanding work. I've seen the outcome of your work last night. And I think it's better you share it with everybody, and then we will go into the comments, and we'll also take on board comments from the experts who are present here. I have several other comments to make, but I will make them after we, you made your presentation. Thank you again, Shakti and Ashok, for inviting me to chair this very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> In fact, Exim Bank, that Africa thing was held very recently only. The one Ambassador Narendra Suri mentioned was held, I think, at uh, IIC or was it somewhere else very recently? That annual 17th. Ah, I remember. So it was with. Anyway, Ashok, over to you to tell us about the project. Thanks, thanks, Shakti. Well, um, Ambassador Narendra Suri, you know, Mr. Shakti Shanha, Sanjay Pulipaka, Ambassador Belinda, women of. Kenya and um, all distinguished participants, you know, welcome to this roundtable discussion on Chinese engagement in Africa, perspectives from India. We are particularly happy to do it at NMML in partnership with uh, you know, Shakti and his team because you know, Nehru Memorial Museum and Library is such a strong, vibrant hub for academic activities. So you bring real value to a project like this by hosting it. Uh, and I'm also very delighted that Nalin is chairing it. He has very strong background, both in China and Africa. The China background is, of course, well known as ambassador to China in other capacities. But Africa also has Secretary West in EMEA, you know, as Director General of ICWA. He has done a lot of work. So we are looking forward to your you know, comments on the projects uh, later this afternoon. Shakti asked me to, to introduce the project. You know, as you know, Today, our discussions will be in two parts. Uh, first part, uh, as Chair suggested, uh, will be to present to you the preliminary findings uh, of this uh, research project uh, on infrastructure development in Africa, an examination of Tanzania and Kenya. Uh, it was initiated by the Institute of Chinese Studies in April last year just over you know, 11 months ago. And uh, what really you know, 
differentiate this project uh, from many other uh, initiatives is you know the researchers we have you know it's it's a it's a young uh, multi country multicultural research team you know and i would like to you know specially felicitate them for uh, you know moving ahead so quickly on the project we have uh, dr veda vedanathan she is uh, research associate with ics uh, she has a strong background on uh, china and africa in fact her phd thesis is also related to that uh, then we have uh, uh, mr juman uh, gomera uh, gomera is a policy analyst with prime minister's office in tanzania and presently he is taking time off to complete his phd with peking university and gomera is going to defend his uh, phd shortly within next few days so all the best to gomera i'm sure it will be cake walk for you then we have uh, thongbu uh, she is china consultant uh, with sino african center of excellence both of emerging markets group in nairobi and we have two two of bright or uh, research uh, uh, interns uh, one is uday he is here uday kanapurkar with ics and sunaina bose uh, sunaina is there she is with uh, iit madras but she has been you know involved with us uh, closely shortly you know they'll be presenting their research findings three of them you know, uh, veda gomera and uh, thongu and then we'll have q and a session and the chair will step in with or substantive remarks at that time and then second part of this morning's uh, you know discussion will be a round table discussion and we are very happy to have with us you know uh, academics uh, scholars practitioners and members of industry colleagues from cii could not come today because they happen to have their mm -hmm. annual general body meeting uh, on 4th and 5th so they are all preoccupied with that uh, but we are closely engaged with them so we we are interacting with them uh, separately now and we are also happy to have you know deputy high commissioner from uh, kenya present here today with us uh, now as you know africa is rising I mean, this is one very exciting story which is unfolding uh, the growth and dynamism in africa the fact that some of the fastest growing economies in the world belong to the african continent today and the fact that you know the average age of africa is less than 20 as compared to something like 45 or so in europe so there is a huge you know potential and opportunity uh, for the african continent as part of this larger african story we have the remarkable trajectory of china's rapidly growing association with the continent uh, you know since 2009 uh, china has emerged as the largest uh, trading partner of africa last year bilateral trade turnover between china and countries in africa uh, was in excess of 204 billion us dollars uh, i understand that there are more than 10000 Chinese companies operating in Africa, and a large number of you know young uh, energetic <sighs> business people are traveling to Africa in search of uh, opportunities, chasing their own dreams. Uh, the commonly mentioned figure for Chinese in Africa is now one million, so it's a large you know contingent which is there. and china has also come to acquire a sizable investment portfolio in africa and has a significant presence in african industry agriculture manufacturing health education and infrastructure but what is most visible is you know china's involvement in infrastructure segment where africa like the rest of the developing world has a large you know shortfall a large deficit that needs to be plugged Chinese companies, both state-owned enterprises and those from private sector, are rapidly taking up infrastructure projects in the continent, backed up by loans from China, from Exim Bank and other sources, and supported by Chinese state. I think this is an important point to note that kind of support they receive from the Chinese state. Now, estimates from aid data suggest that China has built over 3,000 infrastructure projects in Africa. while official you know chinese statistics indicate that china has developed uh, 
uh, about 5,000 kilometers on roads and uh, railways in the continent. But narratives about you know, China and Africa are really conflicting. On one side, you know, there are uh, reports and perceptions uh, about uh, Chinese companies filling in the infrastructure gap in Africa, stepping in where uh, others are less prepared to do, and giving options to African nations. And there are counter-perceptions, which are also quite strong and fairly widely shared, uh, including in Africa. Now, these perceptions and concerns are about opaqueness of Chinese operations, uh, growing debt burden, African countries and African companies, lopsided contracts, which are sometimes you know, not so readily understood by you know, some of the Af African partners, uh, excessive reliance on labor import from China, and China deploying its excess capacity in Africa. While some of these concerns may have basis in fact, so what is very important to recognize that uh, Chinese companies have created essential infrastructure in Africa, and that's something which is broadly welcomed, that they have done a lot to do that. Uh, now, our young researchers will be presenting their preliminary research findings. Uh, they have explored, you know, many research questions, uh, including what are the corporate strategies and, and modes of operation that are unique to Chinese companies in Africa, how are the Chinese stakeholders navigating increased Chinese engagement, and so on and so forth. I will not try to anticipate their you know, uh, presentation, but I did manage to get a sneak preview of the, of the report and the presentation. So I'll say something with confidence that uh, they have very carefully avoided the pitfall of stereotypes, because there are stereotypes abound when it comes to Chinese you know, engagement in Africa. There are polemical perceptions about what China is doing in Africa. They have sought to avoid that. Uh, they have instead uh, opted for an evidence-based uh, approach, what Chair referred to as empirical work. So there's a lot of focus on that, that let facts speak for themselves, rather than starting with uh, certain conclusions and finding facts to substantiate those conclusions. I think they've avoided that. And uh, what brings you know, depth and value to their study uh, are the case studies that they have carried out. Now, they have undertaken six case studies relating to Dar es Salaam and Bagamoyo ports, Zanzibar Airport, Mombasa Nairobi Standard Gauge Railway, Matwara Gas Project, National ITC Backbone in Tanzania. So these six you know, case studies or projects which are relatively large, uh, they have undertaken. Now, their project is also differentiated from a whole lot of other studies by the fact that there's, there was a very strong, there's a very strong component of field studies. Uh, uh, Veda alone, in fact, she spent nearly a month last year in September, October, traveling in Guinea and Tanzania. If I remember correctly, she conducted nearly three dozen together, three of them together, they conducted nearly three dozen interviews. Now, these interviews, you know, this field work, provides you know, the real you know, substance uh, of uh, the research work, the project they have undertaken. And uh, that they have also made it possible for our researchers to validate their findings on the ground and impart granular details to the macro picture. So they have done the literature review, no doubt about it, but no, they have not, uh, they've gone well beyond that. Uh, they tried to find from the ground level up what's the picture emerging. It's nevertheless you know, a relatively modest exercise because you know, given resources at our command, uh, time that was available, uh, what they've undertaken is limited. And you know, as Chair pointed out, uh, uh, there are findings um, which will need to be validated with, with the more detailed work as we go along. But I'm happy that you know, a young team has not uh, shied away from arriving at some bold conclusions. Uh, uh, for instance, about the correlation uh, 
between Chinese construction and African industrialization. To what extent, you know, Chinese uh, construction activities have aided, you know, industrialization or export-led growth strategy in Africa. But they have some fairly firm, firm conclusion. I'll, I'll let them, you know, spell, those, spell out those conclusions. Uh, and then again, you know, this afternoon, uh, after they have made their uh, presentation and we have Q&A session and comments from chair and others, uh, the second segment will be roundtable discussion. And this is going to be really beneficial uh, in this discussion. Uh, as chair said, we can also look at you know, the comparative aspect. So that was not the main focus of the research project, uh, which, which is mainly on what's happening in Tanzania and Kenya and infrastructure segment. But there will be very valid, you know, convergent comparisons. There will be important, you know, pointers and lessons for Indian entities uh, which are pursuing um, uh, projects and other opportunities in Africa. And as Chair said, uh, India has a very large presence, historically uh, large presence in Africa, which is growing, which is getting renewed, which is getting new dynamism, uh, new dimensions today. So I believe, you know, that exercise will also be advanced by discussions that we're going to have today. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon, and um, we look forward to very productive discussions uh, this morning. Thank you. Just before I hand over, let me tell, in case there's somebody outside who wants to be part of this proceeding, we're webcasting it live on our own website and on Facebook Live. I thought I'd just pass information. Thank you, uh, Ashok. I think without wasting more time, I now request Veda to make her presentation and for her and colleagues to do that. And uh, I, I suggest you make it as detailed as you can because the focus is your work. Our comments will follow. So whichever order you want to follow. The lights can be... Yeah, can we dim the lights or put those blinds put down? Put the blinds down. Who are the blinds? Who are the blinds? Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Alexa suggested this in um, many accounts is a pilot study. Uh, everything from the team to the methodology, uh, it's a first attempt at a very ambitious um, hypothesis. So let me just walk you through um, the timeline of the, of the study. Uh, in April, I joined ICS, and we started sort of hit the ground running. Uh, we started putting together an in-depth literature of review of secondary sources that were looking largely at China-Africa engagement, but also at uh, uh, infrastructure. We started writing the project proposal as we were reading reviews. In May, we continued writing the project proposal, and we started approaching potential funders in Delhi. In June, we started putting together a database of Chinese uh, construction projects in Tanzania, Kenya, we were trying to put together information like which were the companies involved, what was the extent of capital they were investing, what was the nature of the infrastructure, what is the current status. Can you just explain a little bit? Can we increase the size a bit? Yeah. Oh, that can you? Yeah, I think it can be done. No. I don't know. Projection throw about the size. Can you increase it? No, it can't be done. Yeah. And then in July, um, so yeah, in June, so we conceptualized the research methods. We made an exhaustive wish list of if we could go to the field and if we could interview, who would be interviewed. We started putting together that list. In July, we uh, identified institutional partners with Tong's uh, research organization, the Sino-Africa Center for Excellence, and with Repowa in Tanzania. We applied for research permits. We started our team um, conversations at that point. Um, and then the team sort of came together that month. After that, we identified uh, Indian infrastructure companies uh, operating in Tanzania and Kenya and who we could talk to in the field. We interviewed Exim Bank uh, officials in Mumbai because Exim Bank had come out with an excellent report on infrastructure building in Africa. We started contacting Tanzanian and Kenyan stakeholders. We started uh, sending out um, drafting questionnaires. In September and October, like the director mentioned, we conducted fieldwork. So we went first to Nairobi, 
From Nairobi, we took the Chinese built SGR to Mombasa. From Mombasa, back to Nairobi, then to Dar es Salaam. From Dar es Salaam to Dodoma, back to Dar es Salaam, and then to Zanzibar and back. So during the course of this fieldwork, we had identified, okay, which are the case studies we wanted to focus more on. And it largely was projects that we thought were, uh, we had access to and we had a comprehensive idea of. We'll talk more about it in the next slides. In November, once we got back, we transcribed all the interviews. We conducted a few of the follow-up interviews to fill up some of the blanks. We prepared the field notes. We came up with a framework of what the report is going to look like. And then we did the task of dividing the work among ourselves on who will write what. And then the next three months, we proceeded to write the first draft. So right now, as we are disseminating these preliminary findings, we have a very rough, uh, rough draft. And we're hoping to send this out to a few experts. We're hoping that conversations from the roundtable today, uh, can, in comments from there, can be incorporated into the report. And we're hoping to publish by July. So these were the two main questions we had when we were in the field, right? So what are the corporate strategies and modes of operation that are unique to Chinese companies in Africa? And how is the African stakeholder navigating increased Chinese engagement? So like Sir mentioned, because the China-Africa realm has had so much um, you know, coverage in news, journalists, books coming out, there were all of these stereotypes that existed. So our preliminary uh, aim was to first understand before even making a judgment. So why did we pick Kenya and Tanzania? I mean, I don't think I need to explain to the audience that they are major economies in Africa. They're also strong partners of China. There are very uh, regular high-level visits uh, to both of these countries. China is also the largest trading partner for both these countries. There are over 400 Chinese enterprises operating in Kenya and over 500 in Tanzania. And I'm told that these numbers are very uh, tiny, that there's actually uh, the numbers are much higher. They're al they also house some of the biggest Chinese infrastructure projects. Kenya has already been identified as you know, the go-to place for BRI in Africa. These two countries also um, house the Dar es Salaam port, the Mombasa port, and they provide gateways to other landlocked countries in the continent. And from an Indian perspective, it is home to members of the Indian diaspora. They are, they are our traditional partners. But most importantly, we picked Tanzania and Kenya because we knew we would have access to stakeholders. And so every project that we picked, we not only tried to talk to the African officials who were running the project, but to the operators, the Chinese contractors. So every project, we've talked to multiple stakeholders. The next question was, why infrastructure? So like I mentioned earlier, you can analyze China, Africa from any lens possible. And we picked infrastructure as a variable to study. Um, and Gomera will explain. Why. Yeah, thank you, Vida. Um, as, uh, as we have seen now from the background of the study, so the methodology was a post-pragmatic post, uh, approach where we have uh, the general broad of theoretical, uh, and, and then after having the theoretical approach, then we went to the field work. So basically, I'm not going to repeat um, what has been said by the director of the uh, institute, as well as Vida, that... Uh, uh, the increase of uh, stock of infrastructure generate economic growth. So we uh, explored a bunch of research that supports that infrastructure development support economic growth and as well as economic development. So in some theories, they suggest that infrastructure development can cut down uh, transaction costs and uh, therefore improve uh, business uh, environment in the country, and therefore has a positive impact. So from the demand side, um, we, we have already known that from the uh, opening remarks that Africa is a continent that highly uh, infrastructure is highly needed. Uh, we have a huge infrastructure deficit, and in some point, in some studies, they estimate that Africa needs around maybe um, 170 billion each year to, in order to, uh, to, to capture, the, uh, to cure the problem of infrastructure deficit. And so this is what I want to mention is that uh, during, the, during the study, we find it's very difficult to find Chinese infrastructure investment uh, data in Africa. So we have used data of Chinese construction companies, uh, which is basically uh, the revenue that was accrued by the Chinese construction companies. And also it used a broad measure for Chinese infrastructure on, on, in the continent. So this data is collected from China Africa Research Institute from John Hopkins University which is a fairly close to the uh, variable uh, that we used uh, at hand. So 
uh, why, why, Ch why the data from uh, Chinese construction companies is that China infrastructure activities in Africa is likely concentrated in the domain of hard infrastructure. So using the revenue uh, construction Chinese company data in Africa is an, is an indicator that will capture also a soft part of infrastructure. And also majority of China infrastructure activities in Africa are not conducted in form of foreign direct investment and therefore uh, we cannot capture, it cannot be easily captured by the investment data provided by China MOFCOM. So uh, looking at this uh, chart, we can, clearly, we can clearly see that uh, China engagement in Africa from 2004 up to 2016 is basically on trade. Trade is, uh, account for majority of this engagement and followed by uh, construction revenue activities as well as investment which is uh, uh, more or less if you, you can see clearly from this. So uh, the point that I want to highlight from here is that China engagement in Africa is primarily, primarily composed of contracting services as opposed to investment. And if uh, and on the regional uh, distribution of construction activities from 1998 to, 19, uh, to 2016, uh, West Africa uh, account for larger part. Uh, this is because of the uh, resource and also uh, southern part of Africa, the Angora model, which is also account for a large portion of the uh, southern Africa part. And also for eastern African part, uh, I think SDR, we found it's also uh, one of the important uh, uh, indicators that uh, is shown in the. So uh, this is the data that and, and definition and the sources that we used for our study in the quantitative part and in the empirical analysis. So basically here, uh, our variable for interest was uh, industrialization. We wanted to see how does the revenue of Chinese, uh, Chinese construction activities uh, affect uh, industrial, uh, industrialization in Africa and as measured by uh, manufacturing value addition as percentage of GDP. And for the case of regional integration, we also want to see how does uh, Chinese construction activities has impacted the intra-Africa trade as percentage of country total trade. So basically these two were the uh, variable for our interest in this study. And as, I, as uh, I'm not going to uh, put, uh, to go into detail, was used as a control variable. In, in the, in the, uh, this is the model that we used for uh, industrialization to measure how does uh, Chinese construction activities affect industrialization in Africa. And for the regional uh, integration also, we use the second equation. So I'm not going to go into details. Uh, and finally, what we observe that is uh, totally, uh, uh, is totally opposite from the, our theoretical hypothesis and the border literature that we have reviewed, that it turns out that uh, Chinese construction uh, contracts is, has negative correlated with the industrialization as well as uh, for regional integration in Africa. So basically, uh, we, can, we, can, we can interpret this uh, fact as follows. The results depict that statistically significant negative relationship between China construction uh, revenue in Africa as a level of industrialization, especially in the million dollar increase in Chinese construction contracts in particular countries associated with the reduction of manufacturing value addition by 0.02% on the average after controlling the size uh, energy and trade openness. So um, um, this is what we basically uh, have found from the uh, numbers. In, from numbers, from statistics. So basically this is only answers the question of what, the causation, but we cannot really say that what is happening on the ground. And this turns out to a second part of our study. Yeah, so once Gomera had run the numbers and he said that there is a clear negative correlation between Chinese construction to African industrialization or African uh, regional integration, we set out with this sort of in the background. So this is a quick um, uh, chart of the stakeholders we interviewed. So as you can see, most of the stakeholders we've interviewed are from African government departments or officials or companies because we very clearly wanted to listen to the African perspective. We also uh, interviewed over 10 Chinese companies. Tom made it possible. We uh, visited them in their work sites, in their headquarters. 
we also f spoke to a few Indian actors who were um, active in the infrastructure sector, like members from Sharpunji Purunji, Lassan and Chubro in Nairobi and Dar Islam. And we also spoke to a few African um, academics, uh, scholars, uh, consultants. Oops. Okay. So like Sir mentioned, we then picked out a few case studies. So in the report, we, ha we provide the macro perspectives, right? And then we slowly bake, build and make our way to the case studies. So the Dar es Salaam port we thought was very interesting because Dar es Salaam handles, this port handles over 90% of the country's trade. It also is a major, uh, you know, point, nodal point for other la landlocked countries in the area like Zambia, Rwanda, Uganda. However, the port is also really old, so it suffers from certain operational inefficiencies. Um, so the World Bank came out with this report, and then along with that, the National Port uh, Master Plan was brought out in Tanzania in 2009. And both of these reports, what they have in common is that they both recommend that the Dar es Salaam port needs to be refurbished. So then there was uh, an international uh, tendering um, and the contract was won by China Harbor Engineering Cooperation. There were, according to contractors at the China Harbor Engineering Company, there were three Chinese companies. There was one Greek company. There was a South African company. There was a company from Portugal, a company from du uh, a Dutch company. And they beat all of them to get the contract. It is a design and build contract, which is supposed to cost $154 million. The idea is to build and refurbish the existing port. So they're going to be building seven new berths. One to four berths are normal berths, and five to seven are container berths. The reason why this was interesting to us was here is a Chinese contractor who has been very, you know, who until at that point had worked on China Exim funding, but was now working on World Bank funding. So a lot of our conversation very quickly changed to, you know, how does that matter? How is it different? And we got very uh, interesting insights. For one, they said, you know, if you work on World Bank projects, there's a lot of cost overheads that would definitely not uh, be there if it was China Exim funded. So, you know, we prodded a little further and we said, you know, costs like what? And they said, you know, we have to build these rooms for changing rooms. We have to give training to the local employees. We have to pay them salaries on time. We have to treat them very well. We have to, you know, give them HI education and there were all of these things that we don't otherwise have to do and um, and then they also talked about Chinese standards they said when it's China Exim funded we just you know we go build according to Chinese standards but now they say that you have to build according to British or US standards so then we can talk about this later in the Q&A but this was a very interesting exchange that we had the next we thought was Bagamoyo port. So Bagamoyo port, like most of you know, is still very much an idea. But this we picked as a case study because, uh, like you can see, a lot of these infrastructures are at different stages of being built. Bagamoyo is still under negotiation. So the officials uh, that we spoke to, what they told us is the agreement as of now is that the government of Tanzania and China Merchants and Holdings and the Omani State Government Reserve Fund uh, are the principal equity holders with the China Merchants holding 80%. Uh, of ownership. The negotiations are on, but what was interesting was um, we were, you know, some of the major insights that we got were about how difficult it was to negotiate a deal with the Chinese. So some of the points that came across was lack of transparency. For instance, how, you know, they were in the negotiation room and then uh, terms would keep changing or that there was a lack of understanding and then there was also lack of uh, trying to come to a consensus was much more difficult. The next after that was Zanzibar uh, Airport, which again we thought was a very interesting case study. So Zanzibar relies extensively on its tourism revenue. Um, so they wanted to build a terminal, an airport, um, and the contract was won by Beijing Construction Engineering Group. Uh, they are doing the procurement and the building of the airport, while as the design was done by a Beijing architectural and engineering design company. What was interesting was initially the project was ex ex estimated to cost $70.4 million. But after spending $35 million, they came to realize that they had made a very expensive mistake, which was that the runway, the taxiway, was too close to the aero bridge, which meant that Code E aircrafts couldn't land on the taxiway. So as a result of this, what they did was they fired the Turkish consultant who was on the project, and they hired a French consultant. So again, we spoke to the operators, we spoke to the consultant, we spoke to the Zanzibar government to try and figure out where was the mistake, how did this lack of coordination happen. And of course, what ensued was a lot of um, uh, 
yeah, not, not, no real answers. But what was interesting here was that they were renegotiating the terms with Exim. So obviously Exim had cancelled because this was a huge mistake and they had cancelled the, cancelled the funding, the next stash of funding. So as they were negotiating, renegotiating the deal, the contractor, that is Beijing Construction Engineering Group, they were putting in the money, so the work kept going on. So although the Exim funds had stopped, the work kept going on, everybody was being paid. So when we asked the contractors, why are you putting in the money? They said, oh, it's only a matter of time, China Exim funds will come. So there seemed to be this understanding between the contractor, the designer, and the operator. And the next standard gauge railway, as you can see from the list, is the only uh, Kenyan, is the only case study that we've picked from Kenya. However, uh, there were other smaller builders that we spoke to in Kenya, like China Wui, China JNC, who are building real estate projects, who are building roads, who are building bridges. They're, they form, interviews with them have formed part of the larger takeaways we talk about later. But SGR is the flagship um, project of BRI in Africa. And Tong will tell us more about it. Thank you, Vida. So SGR is a project have been talked a lot in these two years. Uh, it's a flagship uh, BRI project in Kenya, constructed by China Road and Bridge Company. Uh, SGR project is a part of the East Africa Master Plan, and uh, it's trying to connect the Mombasa, which is the uh, harbor of the Kenya, and to the Kampala, the capital of the uh, Uganda. And eventually, they aim to contact, uh, con connect with the capital of the uh, Rwanda, uh, Kigali. So the SGR phase one, which connects Mombasa to Nairobi, which is capital of the Kenya, uh, is a phase one, which um, cost a three 0.8 billion US dollar and 90% financed by China Exist Bank. And uh, um, it's spent 32 months to complete this project. And it's began operations since 31st of May 2017. So um, we choose the SGR is not only, it is the biggest infrastructure project since Kenya independent. It's also because these projects have drawn a lot of attention uh, of, uh, on the high cost uh, China debt conflict between Chinese companies and the local laborers. Uh, we found a lot of interesting points in these projects. For example, there is a, um, a misunderstanding the Chinese company do not use the local material. Uh, we have confirmed with the different stakeholders, including the Kenya government and uh, also the Chinese companies, 40% construction raw material is from local. And also uh, we have a, a like deep look on the different issues you will see from our uh, report. I want to explain more. Yeah, thank uh, very much, Tom, for uh, a brief introduction of the SGR project in Kenya. And as far to Mtuara uh, gas pipeline, this is basically um, uh, one of the part of the Tanzania long-term uh, national uh, uh, perspective, whereby uh, by 2025 the country wants to become a, a low-middle income country. So, and this is in line to how, how we uh, develop in terms of uh, improving infrastructure in the energy sector. So traditionally we, uh, Tanzania depends on the hydroelectric power. So recently we have uh, discovered a number of uh, uh, natural gas uh, sites. So one of which is in Twara. So China, uh, China, China pipelines uh, as one of the subsidiary of a Chinese uh, company. So it's, uh, it was contracted to, to build the, uh, the pipelines from Untuara to Dar es Salaam. And the idea was to transform from the hydroelectric power at least to have 50% uh, of uh, natural gas uh, energy in Tanzania. So this is basically uh, one of the interesting cases that we have found that uh, in many parts of Africa that uh, the issues regarding to uh, energy and natural, uh, natural resources, there's a lot of disagreement on how to manage it and distribute and we have seen a lot of uh, resource scarce issues, whereby uh, discovery of uh, natural resources has led to uh, countries to enter into a conflict and, 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 and has a negative impact. So what is, what is a very interesting part of this uh, project is that 
during the operation of the project, there were kind of a criticism from the local population that uh, uh, the benefit of the, of, the, of, the, of the project would not accrue to their, to, to their, uh, to their locality. So uh, this criticism has led to a creative way of dealing, uh, of dealing with the distance. And so we come up with the theme that uh, in this project, the government and as well as the, uh, the contractor, they, they sit together to find a way on how to deal with the criticism from the local, uh, from the local uh, population. So what they did is that they sent some of the local leaders to, uh, to other countries to learn how the uh, implementation of uh, natural gas projects was done. And after coming back, they disseminate, they, they use this uh, local reader to disseminate information to other, uh, to other people in the, in the local area. So this is how they, they, they managed to deal with this conflict. So this is, we found one, one of the interesting cases uh, in, in, in our project. So, and again, for the national ICT broadband, as we know that the issue of digi uh, digital divines uh, across developed and developing countries, <laughs> including Africa, is uh, widely appropriated. Like people like Samil Amin in 1990s, they uh, proposed that Africa would be left behind because of the uh, lack of ICT development. So what we have seen is that in, the, in this project, through uh, China Telecom and Eximbank, uh, they managed to build uh, fiber optic cable across uh, Tanzania and also to connect some neighboring land rocky countries in Rwanda, Burundi, and Marawi in the western part of Tanzania. So we find this is a very interesting case as one of the projects where uh, it will accrue some profit from, from its operation. And also we have seen a lot of improvement as far as uh, it cut down the cost of uh, uh, operations, uh, or it's the cost of internet and some other related activities from utility like he else, he educations and others. So, and the issue now is how this project will, uh, will deal with other related matters as uh, Veda will explain much as uh, we, we have discovered from the field work. Yeah, this project was especially important. Uh, I mean, I think all these projects are very interesting, but this one was very interesting because the operator, which was, um, uh, you know, the, China, the Tanzanian government officials and, uh, and then the, the contractor, which was China Telecom, they seemed to not agree on certain fundamental things, for instance. For instance, they had created, so there was this huge fiber optic cable that ran across villages and cities. And then they'd build these data centers, these internet data centers. And then the Tanzanian government officials were very sure that they had the capacity and the skills to run these data centers. Well, as the, the contractor had uh, very little confidence in that ability. So for instance, when we talked about technology transfer, this was one thing that sort of, uh, you know, didn't seem to fit right. So they said, yes, technology transfer, knowledge transfer was a very critical part of negotiating the contract that was there in paper. But then when we spoke to the China Telecom um, folks, what they told us is, listen, we are not going to give people a four-year engineering degree. So if they show us somebody who can handle equipment, we will teach them to run one particular equipment, but we are not going to train them through and through. So there seemed to be an understanding, but like a differences in the specificities. Okay. As, uh, so for these projects, we have interviewed over 10 Chinese companies. We feel some common features here. Uh, so the first, um, most of the Chinese they own the uh, enterprise. They come to Africa because it's government policy driven. The BRI and to, to push them, you have to go to the Africa and fund the project. Um, and they enter this market as subcontractors, but later they realize there is a market opportunities here. They start to in, uh, they start to invest this country. For example, like GTC projects in Kenya, uh, is which Avic spend their own money to invest those of commercial buildings, the hotel, and uh, also uh, it's uh, three uh, three building and one one hotel. Uh, and also Chinese company cooperate with the local companies, local investment companies to develop this two river mall. It's also Chinese companies spend their own money to, to for these uh, commercial buildings. So we see this trend. They came 
they come to Africa for uh, because it's policy, but then they start to um, they start to be part of the local economy growing. And the second point we realized um, for Chinese company, uh, they are now cha they are now chasing the short term profit as we thought. As a, a private enterprise, you should to think about if I can get profit from these projects. But since they are state owned enterprise, they are not. Uh, rush to make money. They prefer to see the long-term benefit. Um, uh, one of our interviews share uh, with us, like, um, even we don't make money for these projects, but I can get the second projects, I can get the third projects, I can make money by another project. So um, that's long-term perspective make their different from the other uh, players in the market. And also, um, because in, we know the state-owned Chinese company, they are very big, and uh, they ship their equipment from China to uh, Africa, and they prefer to um, fully use it at the different, um, different like, projects. So if we get more projects in this country, that means I can much use those equipment, and the, which kind of um, decrease their cost. Um, the third point, uh, we found the common features of Chinese company. Um, so they are just very, very prefer to chasing the government, um, government projects. So sometimes they will overlook the local contents. Uh, the next, we want to talk about like how Chinese companies win contract in African market. When we did the research, I think everyone think the Chinese companies are very competitive. Um, so the first competitive thing is the pricing. So I think it's, it's we, got, we got it like, like everyone agreeing that, even the Africa officers and also different players in the market, also Chinese company, we agree the Chinese construction company is very competitive. And because uh, most of the raw material from China, and which is quite, uh, quite competitive, and also we have this kind of experience on the construction field. Um, the labor, compared to the Westerns, the labor cost is quite, um, quite competitive, which make the whole package of the um, bidding price very competitive in the market. And the second, because Chinese government um, support in accessing fundings, we have the Chinese Access Bank, which is also a policy-driven um, institution, which provide the um, provide the funding in a very competitive interest. And this part is the Africa government quite prefer. And third thing, um, because the decision making is not for company itself, it's from the higher level of the government. Like um, CCCC come to Africa, it's not because the leader of the CCC made the decision, uh, because the Chinese government tell you, you should go to the Africa, you should take this one. Um, and uh, the first one, uh, the lower local competitions. So, Compared to the Western players, Chinese price are very competitive. But for the local uh, construction players, um, they can now compete with very uh, efficient and uh, very um, experienced Chinese construction company too. And uh, at the fifth point, so in the past 40 years, China have been experienced a huge infrastructure is uh, infrastructure construction. So which kind of, uh, we have a lot of skilled laborers, we have a lot of very big construction companies, they are able to take those uh, projects. And uh, um, also Chinese companies benefit from the comprehensive industry chain. For example, if you want to start a, a construction projects from the design, raw material, and uh, construction, also operation. You all can find Chinese players. We don't have to subcontract to the foreigner players or local players. That's the uh, whole point. We get why Chinese company can win a lot of contract in Africa market. And the last thing uh, we want to talk about the Chinese companies' challenge, their challenges in the operating in Africa. So first thing, um, negative portrayed by media. 
for SGR projects um, last year. The Chinese company have faced a lot of the criticism from media about the mistreating local uh, uh, laborers, um, about the high cost. Uh, so uh, the Kenya SGR spend more money than the Ethiopia um, uh, railway. So, but. So from Chinese culture, we prefer to solve the conflict indoor rather than uh, discuss in public. So in Chinese company, um, when the, some criticize coming, they prefer not talking to everyone uh, rather than like a fo official announcement. So which make them look very bad from the media. And uh, the second thing is, it has been discussed a lot about the cultural difference and the long grip barriers. Even the Africa officers, they think the Chinese, they are not good at communication and uh, the limited English make the conversation uh, not, not very good. And also the Chinese cultural difference make people eat at the different table because we prefer different food. Also make local feel like they are, um, they are being mistreating. So uh, from the, these photos, um, we can see most of the Chinese construction site, you will see this kind of the uh, Chinese slogan. Actually, that means um, we have to work efficiently or work safely, but they are Chinese. They don't have English explanation and they don't have Swahili, it's just pure Chinese. If you are not in Kenya, you probably feel like it, we're in China. Um, so, which make local feel like you are doing the construction thing in my country and you make this very China thing, which make local feel very uncomfortable. Yeah. Um, just a line about the cultural differences and language bar barrier. In the Zanzibar uh, airport project that I talked about earlier, it was really interesting because there was the Zanzibar government representative, the consultant was French, and the designers and the builders and the procurators, all of them were Chinese. So they were saying how they had to come up with their own personal dictionary because one couldn't understand what the other was saying. So even when it came to like technical little nuts and bolts and things, they came up, so they showed us a heavy fat document of uh, like, you know, a dictionary they'd come up with over time so that everyone's on the same page. So these are some of the reflections uh, we had, um, and we've just generally divided them into three. Uh, for the African agency, a lot of people in Nairobi, in Dar, a lot of officials told us that there was a difficulty in comprehension of contract. And this came down to not only negotiating tough deals with the Chinese, but it came down to the specificities uh, that were uh, listed in the contract. Um, in Nairobi, we were also told that they did not have the capacity to negotiate these deals with the Chinese and therefore they had brought in lawyers from Singapore to negotiate on their behalf. Um, both of these countries also had very strong local content policies uh, which said that you had to employ X amount of people, that you had to provide jobs for local people. And it's true, a lot of these Chinese uh, infrastructure projects do generate employment. But what we found was that um, a lot of these jobs that are generated are at the lower skill levels, not high level or mid-level management. So for instance, when we sp spoke to operators, engineers in the Tanzania Port Authority, they mentioned that it's not because of lack of skills like everybody said there was. They said that there were graduate schools in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam, that, did, uh, that had engineers come out every year, but they did not have the opportunity to climb up the management um, levels. But when we spoke to the Chinese operators, they said, listen, in the contract we said we'll find X amount of jobs, those jobs we've given. And also this question of collective strength, it was brought out again that maybe Kenya or Tanzania, these big African economies had the strength to negotiate deals with the Chinese, but maybe another country which had less resources, like Malawi for instance, wouldn't have this negotiation power with the Chinese. So there was a lot of talk also about the role the African Union could play and also the collective strength in negotiating with Africa, not, uh, with China, not just bilaterally but multilaterally. Uh, for Chinese actors, again, localization of labor. It was uh, a lot of Chinese companies did have local labor, but there was also a reluctance uh, in giving uh, jobs to local people. Things like work ethic was questioned. Um, and there was a clear preference for bringing in Chinese workers, but then they had to because they were forced to by uh, the local governments. Um, 
like Tong mentioned, there was also a need to improve international management. Again, this was brought out to us that uh, they often did not understand local culture or language, that the SOEs were not allowed. So one of the SOEs contractors told us that they had, every time the SGR came in the press for the wrong reasons, they had a lot of pressure from Beijing to send a response and explain themselves, but they couldn't even have a social, me social media account until very recently. So they couldn't even put across their point of view. But one of the things that came across in all the, like the Tanzania Investment Authority, the Kenya Investment Authority, everyone told us about uh, one of the reasons why Chinese companies would be preferred is for their entrepreneurial culture. So one of the examples that was given to us is if, you know, if it's a World Bank funded project and there is like a French firm or, you know, another Western firm that's here, the manager is not going to go stay in a place that's too far off the capital. So they'll have to arrange a helicopter service or something that would take the manager from Nairobi to, you know, from Dar to Morogoro or wherever. But in the Chinese projects, the top managers, the mid managers, everybody stayed on site. Everybody stayed in very frugal means. Um, and, you know, one thing they kept saying is once they take it up, then they finish the job. And sometimes they finish projects well before time. But interestingly, when we asked Chinese actors, who are your biggest competition when it comes to buying, getting contracts, they said other Chinese companies. So their biggest competition was subsidiaries. So when, for instance, CCCC has many subsidiaries and there is competition among these subsidiaries. And there's also a tacit understanding that if one subsidiary has one contract in one country, the others would sort of, you know, uh, not, uh, not compete. Um, Indian actors, we tried to see in the field if there were some interactions between Indian actors and Chinese actors. It came down to, for instance, they, were, they told us that some of the Chinese companies subcontract to Indian companies, but they said that they view Indian companies as local companies. Um, they also said, more than one Chinese company said they prefer using the data tipper lorry um, and so on. But uh, I think uh, the large field can be sort of summarized in a quote that a gentleman in Dar told us that the only place Indian and Chinese actors meet in Africa is the casino. Um, they all, the Indian uh, contractors we spoke to from Sharpunji, Palunji, Lassan and Chubro, they said that the big difference was that they enjoyed less government support in comparison to the Chinese. Um, and they also mentioned, when we asked about the contract management, uh, a lot of African officials mentioned that this could possibly be an area where India-Africa cooperation could extend. So the conclusions? Yeah, finally, uh, we came up with the, the following conclusion uh, to say from the quantitative an analysis, we found that negative correlation between Chinese uh, construction uh, activities and African uh, industrialization and regional, uh, and African industrialization as well as uh, regional integration. Mm -hmm. So the possible reason could be the intra-Africa uh, regional trade is too low and also most of the low materials uh, we have seen from uh, different uh, project cases that most of the materials were procured uh, from uh, abroad and not locally procured. So this is the less direct link between the local industries and, and Chinese infrastructure uh, in engagement in Africa. So this is what we have, we have also, observed. If I could just interject at this point. Um, so we figured if Kenya and Tanzania were winning all these billion dollar contracts and all these Chinese companies, and the construction is everywhere for anybody who visits to see the Chinese banners everywhere, then we figured then it should be that the local industry has grown substantially. So we just sort of dug a, one level down and we met with local cement suppliers, local steel suppliers, and some of them are actually closing down shop. You know, so there hasn't been a tangential increase in local suppliers. So that sort of correlated with uh, his uh, statistical regressions. Yeah, this is basically uh, what is uh, uh, line, what is a uh, possible explanation that why we found the negative correlation because uh, nature of Ch uh, Chinese activities engagement in Africa <laughs> is kind of uh, construction services is not uh, kind of investment as opposed to investment mm -hmm. as, a, as I mentioned earlier. So, um, so there's a, no direct link between local manufacturing and the projects, infrastructure project. So this is basically, uh, we come up from the, from, from the field work. Also, the question of African agency, I think we should mention it here. Yes. Every single contractor we spoke to said, listen, we don't set quality. We build infrastructure in Europe, we build infrastructure in Africa. So the quality is set by the African governments. So there was a clear, and, and there were cases where, for instance, in Nairobi,
taken the SGR for SGR construction, all of the raw materials were being imported. And local, they were not buying anything locally. At that point, the, the government of Kenya had stepped in. They had brought, they told us that they had brought the stakeholders and the local suppliers on the same table. And they facilitated this conversation where the argument was that the local uh, products that came out locally did not meet their standards. So they were sort of told how they could raise their standards. And then there was a conversation. And then they proceeded to uh, consume things locally. So then the role of the African agency, I think we need to standards. They said the um, we'll just show you some the Nairobi terminal at night, and this is the SGR terminal. On the one side is the passenger trains, and the other side is the cargo. These are some of the interviews we conducted. Thank you. Thanks to all three of you for this excellent presentation. Uh, a lot of food for thought and comment, I think. We have uh, 50 minutes. We're not going to take a coffee break, right? So if you, if you permit, I'm going to allow this till 12 o'clock because we've already had the coffee break, right? Is that okay? Huh? Is that, all right. Uh, I, I'm going to make several comments uh, at this stage itself, and they're going to be in no clear order because, you know, you've covered so much ground. But let me reiterate what I said in my opening remarks. A lot of the lessons learned, which are reflected in your report, have already been taken on board, at least in principle, in theory, in FOCAC 2018. If you look at the FOCAC documents, a lot of the negativity has been addressed. Now, whether it happens in actual implementation, only time will tell over the next three-year period, because you're going to cover 2019, 2019 to 2021 in the next three-year period. So let's, let's be clear. It's not that the lessons or the negatives have not been addressed, have not been understood by the Chinese authorities. Now, whether in actual implementation Chinese companies do that or not, we will see. That will be only time will tell. The second point I think you need to bear in mind is that whether it's China or India or Turkey or Brazil or Russia, this is additional projects. These are com countries which are doing projects over and above which the old colonial rulers have done or have not done in the last 70, 80 years, and should have done. Now, you can justifiably argue that, you know, they were colonials. Some of the new investments or projects are also colonially oriented or raw material oriented, but that's a different issue. The fact is, all the new partners of Africa are bringing additional projects, additional investment into Africa. So Africa today, African countries, whether it's Tanzania or, I mean, I've been Deputy High Commissioner in Tanzania, I can tell you. Today, the old main partners were Sweden, for instance. We didn't build, didn't build infrastructure in Tanzania. Why not? They basically helped Ujamaa socialism. Now, the question is, when you talk of infrastructure, please bear in mind that infrastructure does not only address intra-regional connectivity. You are actually opening up the country. A railway from Dar es Salaam to Matwara or to any other part of Tanzania to Arusha is opening up the country, is integrating the country, is developing local markets. It's breaking down domestic barriers, whether it's a road or a railway or an airport. Now, you will not see this reflected in statistical regression analysis. It will not happen. That is the whole problem with infrastructure. That is where no private sector companies do infrastructure unless they are related to a particular mine output or something like that or, you know, you're, 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 withdraw you're actually exploiting some raw materials or ex excavating power or something. So please bear in mind that, you know, a pure and simple economic analysis will not do. Infrastructure is expensive. The advantage with infrastructure is that it is not only Chinese investments which will follow. Anybody who wants to invest will invest once there's a railway or a, or a road being built from point A to B. It opens up the market. The intra-regional or inter-regional connectivity is an additional point. You're connecting Uganda, you're connecting Rwanda, you're connecting Burundi, fine. You're connecting Malawi, but you're serving more than one purpose. So, you know, you'll have to, in, in any assessment of advantage or cost, benefit, or return, you have to look at the longer-term horizon. You cannot just look at the short term. So, you know, your current conclusions are fine. There's no problem with that. But you can't, it is not the only conclusion. Right? So you must, that must be addressed in your report. That's right. And, you know, the fact is all the new partners of Africa are providing a clear alternative. And that is why the others are so worried. 
why is DAC so keen that, you know, you come and adopt our standards? They don't understand that we are not talking about aid. We're talking about development cooperation. Yes, these are loans. They are not grants. Most of them are loans. But if the African countries have, 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 have grown debt from the West, they can also grow debt from the East. I mean, China has written out a lot, written out a lot, written off a lot of debt in the in FOCAC for instance. So have we. So these are problems which I think partner countries will have to address with Beijing. We will see what the responses are. So I think there is there is criticism is should be positive. It should not be as if you know this is all negative, because even if you are building up debt, you are still building infrastructure. You are building capacities. Your criticism about training, etc., is very valid. This is where I think there has been a problem in drawing up projects. And I think the biggest problem is, which uh, I think, I, which is not reflected, frankly, as well as it should be in the new FOCAC documents. The Chinese do not really make a differential difference between project and investment. Like most of the projects which China has done in India are projects, or they are mergers and acquisitions. They are not investments. So. You know, I think this distinction has to be made very clearly. There is a higher grant element, for instance, in the new documents which we have to see. Uh, FDI is not the route for infrastructure development. Has not been in any country. It wasn't in China either. A lot of the initial investment in China in infrastructure came from loans, grants from Japan, from China, from the World Bank, etc. Loans, low-cost low loans. So you know. FDI does not develop infrastructure, except in a very limited sense. You have to understand that is that is the reality of the economics. I mean, there's no there's no other way of looking at it. Norm setting, you're absolutely right, but you know, norm setting is also dependent on governments, and you cannot have African Union norm setting. Africa is not one country. Africa is 54 countries. I think we don't understand that. I mean, look, Tanzania is different from Kenya. Forget everything else. And very different from Mozambique, for instance. Even more different from Rwanda, Burundi, or Uganda. The politics is different, the economy is different, the history is different. Just because it is Africa and they speak maybe Swahili does not make it one country or one continent. So you have to take that into account. And that is why African Union projects do not work. I'm sorry, I'm being very candid here, but I, this is, uh, they don't work. Most of the projects we are trying to do at the African level don't work because they can't agree on things among themselves. So, you know, this is something that you must bear in mind. Uh, <laughs> I'm not very convinced by your argument that SOEs don't seek profit. No, no. That's why I don't agree with you. I think the SOE cost structure, like the old public sector in India, a very high cost structure. So they can't, they cannot seek short term benefit beyond a point because their loading costs are very high. You talked about uh, a CEO of a project living in Dar es Salaam and not on the site. But you know, to build infrastructure for all the staff and labor to live on the site is very expensive. That has to go into the costing. Private sector does not do that. The SOEs have to do it because they do the same thing in China for their people. So, you know, I think, I think you cannot come to that judgment so quickly that they are looking only at long-term pr profit and not short-term profit. That's not the case. What is true is what you have said, otherwise all three of you. You know, they, they are very confident that we are going to get it back. Yeah, but you know, they don't, they don't cost it, you see. You see, I'm, I don't have money from Exim Bank, but I'm putting in my own money. It costs me. But they do not put the cost of that money in the project. Money costs, it doesn't matter who is paying for it. So when you go to a bank, a bank will charge you about a 5 to 10, 11 percent depending on the country you are in. But you are not costing it. And that is one of the biggest reasons why Chinese companies are competitive. They don't put cost of finance into the, into the equation at all, by and large. I think please, please address this question because the cost of money is extremely important. In, in China, a project cost of land, cost of water, cost is also important. But outside, the critical thing is cost of money. And that can be very expensive. Uh, I don't want to, 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 to say much more, much more on this, but you know, you talked about an entrepreneurial culture. I don't think that is quite accurate. No, no, 
I think, you know, the, the culture is similar, it depends on, on the circumstances and the project. So simply because the CEO stays on site and does not stay on is not a reflection of entrepreneurial culture. The difference is you are delivering on time. That is what partner countries want. Now, you can deliver on time without being too particularly entrepreneurial. If you're bringing everything from China, and there are no local restrictions, there are no, lo no requirements or local content or whatever, it is much easier to deliver. It's actually cheaper to deliver also. You don't have to train anybody. So, I mean, these are just some broad points I wanted to, to, to make for your consideration before I, I, I open this out. And my final thing is I think you could address one additional point in your report if you have the data. Where is Chinese investment going in these two countries? Sector-wise, you know, investment in these particular projects is fine. They are creating infrastructure. But what is the other Chinese investment that's going in? Is it related to this infrastructure investment or is it independent of it? Then you will get a slightly bigger picture, which will be, you know, because your report should not be seen as something which is intended to simply criticize. I don't think you have brought out enough positives of what is happening. Yeah. So, like, a lot of the uh, points that you brought out, the question of loan, debt, of infrastructure itself, of inter-regional, all of this we sort of address in our report because it's a 150-page report. Okay. So sort of summarizing that for today was the challenge because we were even deciding what to say when. So a lot of the context and background we've left out today, which is there in the report. Okay. Also this question of Chinese investments into these countries. So like I said, initially we provide macro perspectives and then we build our way down. So this we thought we'll just talk about here because these were the you know little things that we got from the field, which we thought maybe an audience like this wouldn't otherwise get to hear. No, I think, I think in your conclusions, there should be a, a balance between negatives and positives because your conclusions basically are leaning towards the negative. But I think there are a lot of positives from these kind of investments also. In fact, you can highlight the negatives even more. For instance, what, in the last five years, ten years, five years, Kenya's debt to China has gone up by several fold. So, no, that's okay. But, you know, it's also brought, you have to answer the question also, why is the Kenyan government taking this money? Would it have got it cheaper from any other source? So I think you, know, you need to bring in, I have not read, you, I only read what you sent me, which is basically what you projected here. But for me, it gives the impression that there is a tendency to lean towards the negative in your conclusions, which may well be the case, but I think you need to present it uh, very clearly in your, uh, in your summary also, so that you know, people don't think you're doing a report simply because you want to be very negative. But, but I must say, I think people in Beijing should read this report as carefully as, 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 as anybody else, including in Delhi, because this has lessons for all of us. This has lessons for all South partners in Africa. So, you know, we don't repeat each other's mistakes, and maybe we can collaborate more. That's the last point I want to make. You know, I think we can do much more together uh, in, in Africa, China and India. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think I said more than I should have said. But I'll now throw open the floor. So please introduce yourself and uh, address yourself to the authors of the report. Uh, the floor is open. Yes, please. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is uh, Ravi Bhutalingam from Institute of uh, Chinese Studies. Ravi, they all know you. That's why I didn't introduce you. <laughs> First of all, let me uh, congratulate uh, Veda, you and the entire team. I think this is a really pioneering work, um, uh, not only for the detailed groundwork that you have done, but for the model which you have developed to, um, to kind of uh, develop the whole project. So the few things I'm going to say, I'm not going to um, expound on the, on the great value of the report, which I've said in these few sentences. I'm going to pick on a few things with the intention of trying to improve it. First thing is, uh, I think Ambassador Suri said there is a disjunction between the, the theoretical and mathematical conclusion and the narrative that the entire report conveys. And when there is that sort of disjunction, I think it needs to be x-rayed further as to why is that happening. Now, 
the benefits of infrastructure are when it happens really the benefits are not apparent the benefits flow over a period of time and so there has to be a time series analysis secondly the benefits are primary secondary and tertiary there is a benefit for example which is fairly quick in terms of the valuation of land and property which is right next to the infrastructure be it the road or a railway or whatever that happens fast but in terms of job creation education all the other benefits um, it takes a it takes time i think your professor barbara morton right in her work has said this can take play out over 10 or 12 years in 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 terms of community development so i think there is i don't know technically how you will do it whether you will take present value or how you will do it to truly evaluate the value of infrastructure but i think the measure you are using for the sake of brevity it's easy it's brief but to my mind it is misleading so you you may have to address that otherwise your conclusions come in two parts one is saying white and the other is saying black and you you kind of then struggle so that's one thing second thing i think you've uh, brought out the complexities uh, of the projects in on the cultural dimension working together etc very very simply and strongly uh, i think one or two examples would work here in trying to lay out what would be the alternative cost for example people criticize the chinese company saying all the components come from china all the labor comes from china all the subcontractors are chinese but as a result of that i think thong mentioned this that there is greater competitiveness they all know each other they work together they form part of a value chain in china and in other projects therefore their delivery is at lower cost and their time taken is lower now if you were to throw open tendering to world tenders and if you were to do all that you would get an alternative b which would be more diverse but i would think the cost would be much more and the time would be much more so if one or two alternative scenarios can be developed then people can say okay i may not like this uniform way of doing it but it is delivering on time and cost if i do the alternative it's going to cost me so much more so what do i feel about that so that's that's my second point third is infrastructure in general is a difficult area worldwide because you're dealing with a lot of complexity acquisition of land displacement of people and and so on and so forth and so these problems in infrastructure are not unique to chinese companies in africa they are there everywhere the i think the key point is again what ambassador suri said what is the learning curve is the learning curve of chinese companies as good poorer or better than other infrastructure companies operating elsewhere and fourthly my last point is again a question of an alternative scenario chinese are giving this this kind of financing package largely by loans uh, and by products in kind and swap arrangements against natural resources and so on what are the alternatives left for african governments if they say okay this this system has got these problems what are the alternatives is anyone else coming to the table and saying something which is somewhat competitive and if they are not then what do they do uh, do they drop the infrastructure development goal or, or or what do they do i think that aspect somewhere in your report i'm sure you might have you must have mentioned it needs needs consideration because it is any decision has to be seen against what are the possible alternatives i'll stop there and end by once again congratulating you and saying that i think your report will make a very very important mark and it should be read not only in delhi in beijing but all of, all through africa and elsewhere as well
Thank you. Thank you, Ravi Shesh. We'll take three of our questions, and you can start with more. Or do you want to take them all together? Three, three or four together, and then yeah. Okay, Shesh, please. Um, again, uh, let me congratulate also the young team. Uh, we've done very good and uh, a very investigative work. Uh, just two points very briefly. Uh, dwelling further on what uh, both Mr. Bhutalingam and uh, Ambassador Nalin Suri mentioned, the same point about the regression. Uh, uh, because infrastructure is a public good. And uh, it can have a variety of uses, and it depends on how you make use of it. Uh, but since you have come out with this negative finding, uh, some of the aspects come over a period of time. I'm not sure if you will be able to analyze them fully. But one aspect, if you could focus on, which might be useful, because a port, for example, uh, can facilitate export, but it can facilitate import also. So, uh, has it facilitated more imports? And if you mentioned about cement products, certain uh, factories closing down. Have these have improvements in infrastructure facilitated more imports to the detriment of even existing local industry? That is an aspect, I think, which, which uh, you might uh, perhaps like to investigate a little further. Uh, in which case, the priorities chosen for infrastructure development probably should have been somewhat different, which promotes industrialization first before you start importing. Of course, import, uh, imports are also necessary for industrialization. But you will have to sequence them in a manner that there is balance. Uh, so that's an aspect that, that you can look at. The second area, more in terms of uh, suggestions, uh, you have done the six case studies. Uh, again, in the same light, if they have not contributed to industrialization in the way, would you suggest what are the ways by which they can think of new industries or projects by which they can write piggyback on the inter, uh, infrastructure development put in place already. So that will be a very useful suggestion in terms of uh, further industrialization and for companies to take on uh, making use of existing infrastructure. I thought these two aspects will give it a little more uh, 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 substance to the report. Thank you. Yes, sir, please. I teach in uh, JNU. Uh, very interesting reports. Uh, this, uh, we are doing similar kind of studies in trying to compare South Asia and Southeast Asia and Central Asia. Uh, very interesting findings. And uh, I have one or two comments to make. First is, you know, the, the correlation and the finding that there is a negative correlation that too between the what you call the construction revenue and industrialization and uh, regional integration. This is a little far-fetched, I would say, precisely because you have uh, several variables in between, indicators of <laughs> industrialization, indicators of market integration, or regional integration, so several variables, one. Secondly, there will be a very, 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 uh, what you call it, strong influence of the lags, right? You have, you, you need to have adequate uh, lags in between. Then you will also have presence of large number of proxy variables in what way you can dem really demonstrate this. So at this stage, I think an econometric analysis would be a little immature, but I would feel uh, much more rational and logical would be a pre- and post-analysis. What was the situation before all these infrastructures were created? The, the, the GDP, uh, the outputs at a very, very grassroots level, the different facets of output. 
and what is the post situation see after two years how they have started growing uh, one segment could be natural uh, growth the other segment could be triggered by this kind of interventions so I think that would be much more maybe you can do such kind of e in econometric analysis maybe after 12 years 10 years 15 years with a significant time lag and when you have a good set of time series data my uh, second uh, uh, plea to all of you in order to enrich your research findings I think it will be very important very interesting for the policymakers both in Africa and rest of uh, the, the global community to compare the major parameters or variables among these projects since you have done these six projects intensive analysis of these six projects could you could you give us a kind of a broad picture of what are the similarities and what are the striking dissimilarities because it's done by the Chinese a lot right and basically on infrastructure related projects so if you are able to give us a broad picture of uh, how a Chinese company has approached in a kind of more or less a similar geography right more or less similar sector in 10 different uh, issues say for example on raw materials how they have managed second on labor third third on land acquisitions displacement issues then the services like banking insurance then the fourth would be loan conditionalities including repayment default what are the default conditions right and the fifth would be on the project maintenance part of it who is going to maintain it then what you call the skill formation part of it, after that then uh, technology transfer and uh, the last would be the output management how there if you are able to give us this then you you see how how or the same country and the same approach and same geography have differed in approach and that would bring us very interesting results for us to see in what Chinese are doing in Pakistan right say for example uh, it's quite interesting to see that I we were studying the the Gwadar and the Haman Tota in two different geographies right in two different countries right and uh, what were the, who were the companies involved in this what were the conditions what were the who did the feasibility report what were the parameters incorporated in feasibility feasibility reports techno economic service and how these feasibility reports the various parameters were actually integrated with the finances it's a very intriguing uh, situation so my last point would be you know one of the things which very clearly came out in both uh, the presentation by ambassador suri and ambassador countries uh, when they said that we should go out of stereotypes right all kinds of there is a class of discourse right which is very uh, remarkably uh, uh, seen in in today's literature there is a discourse which you said that that the the World Bank the ADB or or any other international institutions will have their managers sitting in air-conditioned room far off enjoying all the facilities right and uh, in contrast you'll find the Chinese managers would be doing mingling with local people eating local food wh whatever it is right or, or some kind of things like the, being in the being in the factory or around factory right now there is a some kind of a class of discourse that is there is an established discourse that this is the way how to manage a project right and the other side of the story is there is some kind of a new model of managing a project doing a project right so the people who who designed this discourse at the global level would not like this discourse to really come up right we have seen that very very clearly the norms international environmental norms on technological norms on all kinds of you know labor norms and all so please if this report would be of tremendous value if you say what is that non-traditional management 
parameters Chinese are trying to include into it. Because if you read the AIIB literature, right, the objectives, is basically, it basically says that it is to bring new financial uh, investment, fin investment and financial architecture at the global level, away from what IMF does, what ADB does, or what World Bank does, right? It says that very clearly. So there is a, apparently a class of discourse. Say, for example, loan, as Ambassador Suri was absolutely saying that, the loan element, the debt element was always there. Otherwise, there would not have been a plan like Baker plan in 1980s. There would not have been several other programs for rescheduling of these debts and all kinds of things, right? But why we are highlighting uh, the debt today? Why not we highlighted the debt situations in Africa for the last uh, 30? If you see the untied reports and all, you'll find this. So that's my point. Thank you. The last question in this first round of question and comment, Ambassador Amino. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you all for that very comprehensive report that you've done. Um, I believe that there are some gaps that probably didn't come out due to the truncated nature of your presentation. Um, as a government official, it is very difficult for me to, <laughs> to, to speak candidly about some of the issues raised. But I feel that um, maybe we needed to go in depth a little more about why we have gone the China way as opposed to the traditional ways of um, having our infrastructure facilitated, you know, um, the whole element of the debt, I feel that a lot of the time we have the Western narrative which is being pushed to show that it is not the correct way for Africa to go. And for reasons that we are aware of, you know, it might be <laughs> that they feel dislodged by the Chinese influence in Africa. Then when you talked about the um, infrastructure, the Chinese infrastructure having a negative correlation to industrialization, I am inclined to believe that that is not entirely accurate because I feel like many of these, uh, a lot of that Many of those projects had existed long before the Chinese came. They were not existing because of the Chinese. So we need to be careful about how we word some of those things because it's, it looks like their very existence depended on the Chinese projects, which is inaccurate. <laughs> um, and as I said, being a government official, there's only so much I can say, so I will stop right there. <laughs> That is very useful. I think you were candid enough. I think our team has understood your message. Uh, Veda, would you all respond now, please? Um, so when we begin the report, right, we have a whole section about how the benefits, I mean, the tricky thing about studying infrastructures, like many of you mentioned, the benefits of this infrastructure, the impact of this infrastructure. We probably should go back in 15 years and do like a follow-up study to the study to see, to assess impact. Um, and therefore, it is difficult to calculate. So the negative correlation part, I mean, when we write it in the report, we are very cautious when we say that because, again, like you said, the time lapse, it's, ve it's a very small time. And a lot of these, you're right, a lot of these projects have existed. But what we thought was interesting was like what Ambassador Sheshadri said. We thought it was interesting to look at the, their interaction with infrastructure that pre-existed. For instance, the SGR, for example, right? So when you travel in the SGR, there's already a highway that parallels the SGR, which is an old colonial highway. Right? But however, we were told that the government of Kenya has made it compulsory for uh, businesses in Nairobi and Mombasa to use the SGR and not really the highway. So there were, and that is also part of you know, making sure the SGR becomes um, you know, profitable and it, it make, becomes viable. And a lot of the businesses we spoke to said that SGR is actually, in theory, more um, efficient than the highway. But the problem, of course, was with the last mile connectivity. 
the ports, the customs, it would take much more time than the roadways and so on and so forth. So that was an interesting part of the interaction. And I completely agree with you. The, we have another section on the question of loan and debt where we argue that this alarmist literature that we went uh, reading, going into the continent, that alarmist literature stopped, shot, I mean, stopped short very quickly because there is a certain nonchalance when they speak about the loan and the debt, right? Um, if I may quote one of the interviewees that told us um, when we asked him, are you afraid that your government will not be able to pay back the loans or like is, there, is that a concern? And he said, you know, um, the British have been mining diamond mines in our country for over a century, and we've not made a penny out of those mines. So if you're asking me, am I scared of China? The answer is no, but I'm scared of the white man. So this anti-West sentiment was, I mean, so a lot of uh, scholars we spoke to, a lot of officials we spoke to, um, there was definitely a nonchalance when it came to the debt narrative. And uh, we were also told repeatedly that uh, it was largely um, a Western narrative, and we had to be careful when we addressed that. Um, and so the question of broad picture, it's interesting you said that because our questionnaire was exactly based like this, raw materials, project maintenance, labor, land acquisition. So the only question that we didn't get answers to, honestly, is the loan question. A lot of people shied away from even talking about the contract or the conditions of the loans. That's, that was a no-go. But uh, this was actually very interesting because what we've done right now is we've answered all these questions project-wise, but we haven't looked at it. Uh, you know, zoomed out and looked at it. So I think that would that would be a very uh, interesting um, addition to the report. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, let me uh, reply on the uh, uh, regression part. Um, yeah, I totally agree that uh, correlation always doesn't mean uh, causation. So that's why in the in the last uh, part of the of the conclusion. We say this could be a possible possible reasons. So correlation uh, doesn't mean uh, causation. So and for the, for the uh, in, in the process of uh, running the model, we actually learn some other tests. Like for example, we check for correlation, multicollinearity between the variables, and like we employ like Osman test to see whether whether fixed model, uh, lambda fixed model is appropriate. And so again, uh, we were very much. Uh, grateful for your comment, and we are going to look at it uh, more deeply and see whether we can, uh, we, can, we, can, we can go back through the process and, 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 and report back. So, and in the, in the case of, uh, for example, like uh, when we say, um, when you look at the nature of Chinese um, um, uh, infrastructure uh, investment or infrastructure, infrastructure project, like we have... Uh, Explored to a number of uh, stakeholders, especially the government officials, and, 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 and so what they normally uh, they confess to us that um, the procurement part, w the, each country in these in these two countries, like Kenya and Tanzania, they all have a local content policy, which have a certain requirements for any project to procure or to hire local laborers. So, but actually, what is happening? The huge chunk, like in terms of percentage is uh, procured abroad. We are not blaming that because most of the material, especially in the high tech, like for example for national broadband ICT project in Tanzania, were locally not available. So we are not blaming the Chinese for procuring abroad, but we are saying that the African agencies should also be uh, aware of what is happening actually and, and then for, for in order to capture the benefit. And also the issue of time is also, uh, uh, we are grateful for that. Uh, it's, it's, we have to be sensitive to say that uh, the benefit of if infrastructure project can be accrued for overtime. We cannot see it in the overnight. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, uh, we appreciate for that comment, and we are going to, uh, to look deeply and go uh, back through the process and, and see whether we, we have made uh, uh, some, we can, we can make some correction in some areas. Uh, so I want to talk about a little bit about Chinese company long-term uh, profit thing. Actually, because the time limited, we don't discuss more during the presentation. Actually, this problem have different angles. So the first, the Chinese construction companies, they prefer stay in Africa for a long time. They prefer to take the first project, second project, a consistency. And one of the reasons they can do the projects agreeing with the um, 
with this gentleman about uh, infrastructure projects are very expensive, but also Chinese company can take a very competitive price because uh, the equipment is already here, the people are already here. They don't expend more money for the second, the third projects. That's the first thing. A second thing, we also have to consider the Chinese internal problem because we don't have any more infrastructure projects in China now. And the people capital also cause internal China thing. So that's why we have this policy go abroad or BRI. Um, because if we push those people go abroad, this kind of cause less for our internal thing. So it's also another perspective the, why the Chinese uh, sorry, uh, construction company looking for the opportunity outside. But for China's um, decision maker, for them it's like, even you don't make money outside, you still save money internal. So for there, it's still benefit. Uh, that's just a little bit more about that thing. Second round of questions, then we'll open up for the round table discussion. Dr. Ray. <coughs> First of all, uh, congratulations, Veda, for that, your team, for this uh, very good, uh, excellent uh, presentation and your work that you have done. You know, my question will relate to the first aspect that you talked about, regional integration, the negative correlations. When I look at your six case studies and uh, the kind of correlations that you have reached about, it has negative impact on the regional integration. I somehow cannot correlate when I look at your case studies because you are doing Bagmaya port, you are doing Dar es Salaam port. You have done a case study of SGR only on the Mombasa and uh, Nairobi connections, but you have not gone beyond that. So how did you come into this correlation? Is just a literature study? Because if you go by Kenyan government's perspective or China, uh, uh, you know, China's perspective, they all said it is going to support the AU to, uh, Agenda 2063 uh, CFTA project. All these BRI initiatives will actually help uh, continental integration. So uh, I somehow you need to explain me about how this, because if you talk of SGR, if you don't do uh, a project analysis going beyond Kenya or Zambia, where this whole connectivity of railway is connected, In Zambia, for example, Tazara is there for all. But look at where the East Africa community is doing, that their master plan. They're trying to put East Africa community in the central from the CFTA right from the Cape to the Cairo. So they, whether, so your projects is very, you know, since six case studies does not fall into the larger, uh, you know, conclusions that you're reaching. Some way I find that gap is there you need to address. Second, in your uh, um, study, have you uh, tried to look at, uh, you know, what, what uh, you know, about industrialization again? Uh, what are the variables that you have taken to come to the conclusion that it has not uh, led to that? For example, let's say about uh, airport in Zanzibar. So how did you come to that conclusion? Because nowhere you did to uh, stress on those facts. 
second thing is you managed to do the toughest thing, which is field work, because I don't think similar interviews would be possible in India. The Chinese companies are operating here. So those are the good things. And in terms of suggestions, you have received a lot of suggestions, but a practical one is, uh, there was a similar statistical study done in 2007 by a person called Bakhi, where he, for the first time, studied Chinese overseas investments along similar parameters, you know, the political stability of the host country, uh, what impact it has on that, you know, economy and so on and so forth. So maybe you can use that study as some kind of a framework. And also, uh, to add to other comments, uh, maybe uh, what is, uh, when you are uh, giving a non-Western perspective, what you should do is you should see whether uh, overall as a country, whether Kenya and Tanzania have a very high debt levels, and in that context, is China forcing more debt? That maybe can be, uh, you know, criticized. But what I have heard is uh, Kenya's median age is much lower than India, and there's a lot of potential. And Kenya desperately needs these projects, which have been delayed by you know several uh, years. So I think that kind of a zoomed-out perspective uh, will be more objective. And uh, the, my last point is. Uh, on the attitude of Chinese companies towards Africa, uh, I think uh, what will make more sense is uh, how they choose these areas, because Kenya, Tanzania, I think, are uh, countries which represent a lot of potential, uh, just like Nigeria, maybe. Uh, so maybe you need to look at that at an Africa level and see how China has chosen uh, you know, these projects. And there's also angle of you know, how many of the projects are prestige or trophy projects, like building some, you know, government, you know, parliament building or something, or if it's a railway. So I think all these uh, infrastructure uh, projects are pretty good. And I also, I think uh, there was a comment you made on how Africans don't have capacity to deal with, you know, uh, bilateral negotiation. I, 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 I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's a huge generalization because what I think, you know, Djibouti, a small country, has American bases, Chinese bases, French bases, I think that requires a very high level of sophistication, you know, to have uh, discussions with uh, countries. So that I kind of disagree with. I don't think, uh, you know, China, you know, dealing with China is that much of a challenge for African countries. And the last point, which I think you should probe a little more, is the India linkage. Uh, you said the Indian contractors in Kenya or Tanzania are viewed as domestic contractors. I think this is like a win-win situation because uh, if African countries want to push for uh, domestic content and if Indian contractors are already there and uh, today Indian companies are bidding for airport construction in you know Maldives and Greece and Brazil. So I don't see any reason why Indian companies can't participate in design of infrastructure projects because I think that Design cost is also sensitive, right? I mean, similarly, just like how Chinese cost is lower than Western companies, I think Indian design cost will be lower than uh, French or you know any other consulting company which does the design cost. So I think that is, should be probed a little more. Maybe uh, you know LNT, Shafur Polanji, and you know GMR. These are the big infrastructure companies which are going out from India. So maybe you can interview them here in India at headquarters and see what is their sort of perspective on these African countries and and of course they will have to get familiar with Chinese standards which is again a potential for cooperation because if Indian companies understand Chinese standards, construction standards and can design projects which are acceptable to the Chinese, I think the African countries will welcome that package because uh, there's no disconnect, there, there's no expensive mistakes of you know uh, constructing these uh, runways in the wrong way. So I think that you can probe because at the end of the day, this will be seen as an Indian perspective on Chinese involvement in Africa, and it will be good to put some you know meat on the table for you know Indian uh, scope for Indian participation. Thank you. Would the authors want to react? Um, before I hand it to you, because I know you, you really want to defend this. Um, okay, so I think it didn't really become clear in the presentation, but the quantitative aspects, like you can imagine. We couldn't get any data on construction, um, like Chinese construction in Tanzania or Chinese construction in a province in Tanzania or in Kenya. So all of the quantitative stuff, the data from the China Africa Research Institute in Johns Hopkins, is pan, it's pan-Africa. 
So or the quantitative regressions is uh, on a continental level. But the problem is we were very clear from the beginning. We didn't want to just write a report on Africa, right? Because again, of course, it's made up of 50 odd countries and it's very, very different regionally. Um, so then the idea was, okay, so we have this pan-African perspective and this is what the numbers tell us on a continental level. Now let's just go to the field, to specific projects. So these projects are in no measure talking to the numbers. These projects are just specific case studies to just see, but how does this work out on the ground? So we asked the Chinese contractor simple questions. How did you get this project? Like how did you, you know, what was the bidding process like? How many laborers did you bring in? What kind of management uh, techniques do you use? So these are two different sort of approaches which we hopefully will try and sort of connect through the report. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, add up to what uh, Dr. Veda said, is that um, we moved uh, from the, like we, we, employ, we employ the deductive approach, like from general perspective to uh, inductive and to uh, like a micro level and see what is actually happening. So this was the approach for, for our study. So it's a mixed uh, method. So coming back to, uh, direct to the question that you asked, uh, in the sample we use, um, out of 54 African countries, we managed to have data for, for 40 African countries and in each model. And uh, for the time series, is, uh, the data cover from year 2003 to year, to year, it was to year 2016. And the number of the observation was uh, limited to uh, 617. So this is basically how we come up. And uh, for, the, for the measure of a manufacturing value addition uh, as, a, as, as, a, as a measure for industrialization. This is basically come out from uh, different uh, literature, board of literature that we have been uh, uh, reviewing that uh, a, a quiet measure for industrialization for any country, you have to see how this country has structurally transformed from its uh, primary sector to uh, uh, secondary sector and into tertiary sectors. So. Uh, MVA is one uh, very common uh, method uh, indicator used to measure industrialization. Thank you. Yeah, I want to answer the question how Chinese uh, choose those projects. Um, actually, uh, they do have some patterns. Um, so um, it's basically, it depends on the negotiation between Africa company, uh, sorry, Africa countries and uh, Chinese, Chinese leaders. So uh, as I know, um, the SGR phase two, phase three is still pending because they haven't figured out the deals. So now Chinese government very cautious to, to the desk because they have been criticized a lot. You have been given too much loans to Africa country. And so it's basically if they gave the preference loan, it depends on the negotiation between Africa country and the Chinese high leaders. And the Chinese leaders will decide if, uh, if they will sign the, the, the loan by China Access Bank. That's the thing I want to say. Yeah, that's all. Thanks. <coughs> we have a question? Yeah. We'll make it the last question then because we have to shift, move on to the round. Well, I am Suresh Punjai, journalist. Uh, this question is addressed to Dr. Beda by Dinatan. You mentioned about the bitter experience of the vendors. Uh, uh, that is one aspect. And uh, the quality factor or, or the standardization when it comes to ports and uh, airports, uh, there is nothing known as Chinese standards. ICAO, it has to, an airport has to have all the facilities as for the ICAO arms. Then uh, the seaports, uh, they go by the uh, international maritime and admiralty factors. You know. And uh, other than infrastructure, are there any turnkey projects undertaken by the Chinese companies in uh, African nations? Just quick one. Um, 
for the for the Zanzibar Airport project, all of these uh, international uh, standards were part of the of the of the deal, and also there were some additional requirements. For example, for the SEPT part, they applied like uh, uh, UK standard. So some of the Chinese standard, standards and international standards was also part of the of the deal. But I think the problem was the consultancy, like uh, the leading consultancy. He, he, there was no coordination between uh, different stakeholders. That's why there was an expensive mistake. Um, and just to the suppliers, the local suppliers you asked about, that was actually very coincidental because a couple of people uh, told us that a lot of contractors that we were talking, and some, uh, Lama said this comes back to your question, right? When we talk to a Chinese contractor and we say, where do you source your supplies from? They don't say China. They say we get everything locally. If there's something that we don't get locally, then we bring it from China. So then uh, we uh, contacted uh, Sharpunji Pulunji, Larson and Tuberman. When we spoke to them, they sort of gave us the contacts of local uh, cement manufacturers and local steel manufacturers. So then we went to these industrial areas and we visited their offices, which again is very tricky, right? Because most of them thought we were spies and they wouldn't even let us through the door. And they were like, why are these girls asking us about where, who's buying our cement? So then once we convinced them that we were not spies and we were researchers, uh, then they sort of opened up a little bit. And then they gave us contacts of other suppliers that we could speak to. So we've traveled to Mombasa to speak to one of the oldest cement suppliers, right? And all of them across the but again, I, I understand there's a risk of generalization here. So when we say, like when we suggest something, it's not to say that all of Africa, this is a problem, and all of Africa, this is a pattern. And this has to be, I think, made very clear in the report, very case sensitive. But one thing that they told us in Kenya, for instance, was that our industries have not grown, even though construction in our cities have increased. So again, taking into consideration the paucity of time, the paucity of money, the fact that we were like doing interviews back to back. Would I, I got a list of 25 cement suppliers in Kenya. Did I have the time to chase all of them? No, I went and spoke to three of them. So we should definitely do follow-up questions. And this is by no, by no measure a generalization, but a, a tidbit we sort of found in the field. Thank you. I think <clears throat> short point in this is, well, my first uh, a comment, the very fine line between spying and researching. So, <coughs> 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 No, I think, I think we've had a very interesting discussion. I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. This is an extremely important beginning. <clears throat> you've done a very good uh, job with this. I think you've got a lot of ideas and suggestions on how you can actually finalize your report. I was telling <clears throat> Ambassador Khan that, you know, in my view, you should have more recommendations and no conclusions. <clears throat> no, because, you know, I think it's, and the point is this is the beginning of a process. And, you know, you'd be doing many more reports. I think it's a very, very good beginning. And I would encourage ICS to do more of this work. And, in fact, I'd encourage ICWA to do more of this work also and the others. Because, <clears throat> we, you know, the example of what China is doing is relevant to what India is doing. <coughs> Excuse me, all the criticism that Chinese companies face, we also face. It's not new. It's going to happen. And our competitors are going to make this a point of reference all the time. So whether it's debt or other things, I think we need to bear that in mind. But I'd just like to once again congratulate you for an excellent piece of work done. We wait to see your final report. <clears throat> I hope you'll share it as much as you can. We'll now move to the second part of this. Okay, Ambassador Khan first. Just a note, ma'am. <coughs> what uh, Ambassador Suri said is absolutely, you know, valuable that uh, it's beginning. We need to do more. And it's exactly what we are going to do. In fact, um, uh, with this report, which focused on uh, Kenya and Tanzania, uh, now we move on to Zambia. So later this year, in fact, uh, we'll do a, again field field work based report on Zambia, and that's how we keep expanding. So we have a nucleus. We expand further on it. Hopefully, conclusions will also recommendations will keep you know getting refined, fine tuned in the process. I'm glad I, I said, you know, the more more you do on this subject, I think it will be good for all of us, so both India and China. Okay, we now move into the second part of this workshop, which is the uh, roundtable discussion. You've seen from the program leaflet in front of you, there are five themes for discussion. Uh, the, the themes are India's approach to Africa, influence of the China factor. Second, China's engagement in Africa versus the rest. 
Third, a role of African agency. What is Africa's strategy for engaging India and China? Fourth, experiences of Indian corporates operating in Africa, compelling, competing or coexisting with Chinese actors. And finally, Indian contribution to developing African in infrastructure. My suggestion is that we will we have till one o'clock, which means another 50, 50 minutes. Uh, once all of you have made your points, uh, I will ask the authors of the report for their comments on this. And uh, if I may, Ambassador Amina, may I ask you to start this discussion? Or is that not fair? That's not fair. Okay, you, I, I, I'll, ask you, I'll ask you to come back onto this, but maybe I'll ask Pramit to start this discussion. Pramit, would you like to start? That's even more unfair since I... <laughs> uh, that's, that's solely because I lived in Africa for many years, not because I've actually studied it. But um, I'll just say a couple of points based on what I've heard. I haven't actually had a chance to see this uh, report uh, per se. Um, moving on to the bigger picture. Okay. Well, I think that what is important about reports like this, and this goes to what a lot of people have been saying, we actually have very little knowledge, especially on the financial aspects in infrastructure development. And as has been everybody's mentioning, Africa is a continent, uh, and within Africa the, ver the variation uh, both in terms of the capacities um, and so on, is, is incredibly large. Uh, the difference between, let's say, a Central African Republic and a South Africa are, are two ends of, of the development spectrum. And so, which is why, ultimately, um, so I think Carrie was mentioned as the Center for uh, Growth Development Research. Uh, a lot of private companies that now RWR Global, Rhodium, uh, Merics, which do work on, on China's investments, not just in Africa, but around the world. And as they, the micro studies that they're generating bit by bit uh, coming together, hopefully over the next five, ten years, you'll get a better sense of what's actually happening uh, in China and Africa at the granular level. Um, I should also add one of the important developments that I'm seeing in terms of data that's coming out is that China itself is recognizing that a lot of its projects, some of them <clears throat> under the Belt Road uh, BRI, but BRI itself has now become such a general, generalized term. It covers over 15,000 projects around the world, and the Chinese government, as some of you may know, has already begun to argue that this BRI definition is become, getting out of control. Um, that within that, we're starting to see evidence that China's recognizing a lot of these projects aren't working. Um, and they're taking a roadshow across. Uh, they've uh, begun roadshows. I've been in part of some of them in Hong Kong, in London, New York, trying to get private Western investors, uh, private Chinese investors to take over, become partners in these projects. Uh, and I think we're going to start to see the BRI, and I use this in the most loose ex expression possible, break up into several financial and development models. Some of them are clearly going to be geopolitically important to the Chinese government, so irrespective of the commercial aspects, they will continue to support them. Um, I'm not certain if the ones, I mean, things in Djibouti perhaps, definitely, but the ones closer to home for India, the China-Pakistan economic corridor, definitely, will be one that China will continue to, to focus on. Uh, those will be it doesn't matter what, how much money they lose on those, they will continue to. Some of them we're now seeing, and I think RWR Global's uh, work on this is now pretty clear. They've begun selling out to Chinese firms. They're telling the, Ch the Chinese policy banks have been pulling back and saying, offering it to a Chinese firm and say, you take it over if you think it's commercially viable. We're starting to see a bit of that, especially in Southeast Asia. Um, Third group they're being offered, and, I've, and I was at a, in a meeting in London where a group of advisors to the China Silk Road Fund, uh, some of the other Chinese policy banks, put forward the argument that we are quite happy to partner now with the World Bank, with the ADB, though they're lots of, less enthusiastic about ADB, uh, World Bank and other multilateral financial institutions and pass on some of these projects and accept the standards of the World Bank as a consequence. Um, and then there's a fourth group. They're looking to sell to private, private equity firms or to private investments. Uh, there was another uh, video con in which I was in where they were offering um, uh, parts of the uh, stakes in the, in this case it was an African one, the Djibouti Addis rail line. And as some of you may know, the head of Sinusure, the Chinese investment insurance company, has publicly said that China's all, he's, his own firm has lost 
one and a half billion dollars on that railway project alone. And that's just the investment, that's just the insurance side of it, let alone what the contractors and others have lost, or the other financiers have lost. And these losses are now building up across the board for, even by the standards of China's money, this is now becoming a little too much for them to absorb. Um, and when you've talked to people in, definitely in, in uh, the Western countries who focus on Chinese finance, whether in government or in the private sector, China's already lost over a trillion dollars and forex reserves have, have fallen by a trillion dollars. And since April last year, increasingly there, uh, I would argue that across the board, when I've talked to, talked to many Chinese experts, at least they don't believe Chinese figures on forex reserves since April last year. Um, so the cost of this, is, and so they're looking for partners. Then the fifth segment, I think, and this is going to be a big question, is that China may abandon a lot of these projects, which they decide are simply just impossible commercially or have no geopolitical consequence. And I think one of the concerns we may have to watch out is that a lot of those are going to be in Africa. Because unlike Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean and the Pacific region, these are not geopolitically all that important for China. And this is going to be an issue that I think uh, will, will play out over time. And a lot of it will depend on the future of China's own macro developments at home um, and, and what happens uh, globally. Um, I think I'll just, a couple of other points I'll meet. I'm a, a little wary when people talk about a Western model versus a China model. There is no such thing as a Western model. That's just rubbish. Um, <clears throat> the World Bank's model is completely different from what KKR or BlackRock does, which is it turned completely different from what Cosinfas in France does. Uh, one of the reasons why Western aid groups have been unable to work with each other in infrastructure is because they're almost incompatible. Uh, U.S. aid cannot work with French aid. German aid and French aid comp organizations cannot function. India has tried to work with the Japanese on infrastructure projects in places we are sensitive, and we cannot work with them. Our models don't work together. Uh, so there's really a spectrum, if you wish, uh, and within the Western rubric, and I say I, I, I find this phrase uh, uh, pretty useless, actually. Um, <clears throat> there's a whole set of different ways of which finance is handled, and debt finance in particular. I mean, if you're just the subject of debt finance itself is a subject that you can spend literally years studying. There's so many variations uh, on this theme. Um, I think some of the points made about the fact that, yes, the, the West, the, the standard World Bank model has become extraordinarily cumbersome. I think the president of Senegal recently said that it takes me five years to clear a World Bank project. It takes me five months to get a Chinese one. What am I, where am I supposed to, well, what obviously will I choose? Um, and, and I think that's one of the reasons we're starting to see a change already when I've talked to us in Japan recently talking to their ODA teams. And they said there is now an internal debate in the Western governments. Uh, in which I include here in Japan, about the need to change the OECD standards on aid, that they are simply too uh, nonsensically difficult. Uh, and as has been mentioned, they have so many bells and whistles attached over the years from various interest groups uh, that this is now no longer a viable, uh, no, no longer a viable project, uh, no longer a viable model, uh, partly because of the influence of China. And I think we should actually thank China for this. China's pushed by introducing a degree of competition on this. We've been able forces a change and something, especially in places like Africa, uh, makes it more viable. I would disagree on some points that were mentioned. I think Ms., uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Butelinga mentioned that Chinese projects are by definition cheaper. That's actually not the experience we're now getting in India's experience in the Maldives and Sri Lanka. When we have taken Chinese projects and put them up for open tender, we're seeing Indian companies come in with bids as, one, as low as one-third the price of the original Chinese projects, definitely the case in Sri Lanka. Uh, and we're seeing this uh, to some degree now in Southeast Asia. I have not seen figures or have not seen any such experiences in Africa, but I have a suspicion I think you'll find that in a monopoly situation, uh, Chinese companies are just as uh, um, um, predatory as, as any other company in the world would be. Um, now, I'll just finally mention about India, because this is obviously an area we're looking at. Um, one of the areas that India and Japan, in particular, who has now become our primary partner in trying to work in Africa. And you may remember there was talk about this uh, so-called India-Africa growth corridor, which the term itself has now been abandoned by the Japanese and the Indian governments. Uh, 
Uh, but at the heart of that was the question is, can we develop a model of financing that is, in the views of both India and Japan, far less predatory than what both China and to some degree even what Western private sector uh, has developed. Uh, and I think Kenya is going to actually be the, the model because, as you know, the railway project is Chinese, but the highway and some of the others that are paralleling it are actually Japanese. Um, the, I think right now, and in particular because the Mozambique part of it is now more or less on, on ice because of other problems in Mozambique itself, uh, but the Kenyan, what we'll see, what we developed, India and Japan can do together, or mainly Japan really, uh, can do in Kenya, I think is going to be one of this, this competition of models uh, on infrastructure development that I'm hoping will develop and, and, and broaden over the next several years. I'll end there. Would like to come in? Ravi, in the bigger picture? Uh, let me just uh, carry on the theme, uh, you know, that you've just uh, laid out. I think it's uh, very important. And um, I think we need to develop what you might call a marketplace of models, um, which customers from, uh, can choose from. And when you develop a marketplace of models on, on fin financing, you always make trade-offs. Because at the end of the road, let's say that if you're spending 100 rupees on a project, you have to see how much of that is going to the suppliers, the subcontractors, the various agencies, and how much value is being delivered at the end to the final consumer of those projects, the public in general. Now, each of these models is going to have different trade-offs. Now, we just heard one example. Chinese managers live frugally, they live amongst the people and so on. So obviously, there you are saving some of the management costs. But perhaps in other areas, perhaps in safety, perhaps in quality, you mentioned some of those, Veda. It is the other way about. So it really requires a, a kind of, uh, almost like a restaurant menu. You kind of get a complete menu when you choose your meal saying I'll have a soup, I'll have this and I'll have that, depending on your appetite, the time you have available, uh, and your nutritional preference, you choose. And similarly, that is what uh, we have to go towards. But right now, uh, there is a paucity of these models, and that is why the Chinese model has been embraced uh, so widely, because it caters to the one index which is immediately <laughs> understandable, and that is cost. And the second index that is immediately understandable, which is speed. But those two come with uh, certain consequences, which are now becoming visible, whether it is safety, labor practices, uh, other things which people did not go into in the beginning, because they were just looking at the two indices of cost and time. So it requires much more sophistication in terms of um, the deciding authorities, which in turn means it is more difficult for them to explain to the public, because to a democracy, in a democracy, if there are three tenders, one is low cost, one is middle cost, but safer and all this sort of stuff, and you go for the middle one, Immediately, there will be an outcry that certainly happens in India if there is anything awarded to less than the lowest tender. So I think these are the practical problems that politicians face, and many politicians, I suspect, without uh, really getting into the area of corruption, go by the gut feel that a project here and now is better than a perfect project 10 years down the line. If imperfect project now is better than a perfect one 10 years down the line, and they go by the gut, I, I think that's probably how many politicians look at it, apart from the other, uh, the role of irregularities. So we need to look at the political economy of this also. This is another factor uh, that would uh, come into play. The, thirdly, um, 
I think it would be interesting to find, find out the history of loans in Africa. How many loans have been given by who? How many defaults have there been? How many reschedulings have there been? What is the percentage of overall debt to GDP? How is it growing? Is there any correlation to development? And how much of the debt is Chinese? And one last point. Um, there are a million Chinese uh, now operating as entrepreneurs in China. When we tend to think of Chinese projects, we are focusing largely on the SOEs and large companies. This kind of comes out in our narrative. But what about these million entrepreneurial folk? And there are a lot of narratives about them. Even the FT had a very detailed uh, story about a Nigerian project. Now, do these companies seek profit or not? I think these small enterprises do, would not have the cash flow to continue indefinitely delaying profit. So how are they doing it? I think perhaps some investigation there might be very useful in the longer run. And um, the role of India-China cooperation in Africa has, I think it was touched upon, Ambassador Suri mentioned it. Uh, what is the scope there? in terms of uh, uh, marrying the two countries' resources together, we seem to be here caught up largely in a narrative of competition rather than looking at avenues of cooperation. For example, we know Government of India's view on BRI, but what is Government of India's view, for example, in Indian companies participating in Chinese projects, even if they don't have a view on paper, Indian businessmen are very sensitive to not crossing government's view, even if it's not written but just implied. I think some of these undercurrents need to be looked at also. Thank you. Santosh, yeah, please. No, I just, that's very interesting. So Sinoshore actually can be a very good proxy to study engagement in Africa because uh, most of these SOEs don't move a finger without Sinoshore financing, uh, sorry, insurance. And anecdotally, you know, uh, for example, Sinoshore's outlook on Pakistan is that they're willing to take 90% commercial risk cover on projects, which is CPEC, you know. And in India, it's close to 50%. Now, because Sinoshow is making losses, it's very difficult for them to justify this difference because any insurance company will look at stuff like, you know, the legal system, how easy it is to uh, invoke guarantees and enforce contracts. So that could be a very good point, to, you know, like a sort of a thumb rule to see how they are choosing these projects uh, because uh, I'm guessing, I'm guessing it is, you know, more closer to Pakistan what Sinoshore will insure in Africa uh, rather than 50% because that is 50% is really low. Uh, if Sinoshore only can insure 50%, very few SOEs will volunteer for projects like this. So if, uh, you know, if you can get on, uh, get on to some data from Sinoshore uh, about which uh, project they're insuring in Africa, because these are all done projects. I don't think it's that sensitive. Uh, it should be visible either in Sino Show's financial statements or some of these people you have interviewed, they might be able to even informally tell you how much percentage of uh, insurance cover that Sino Show has given. And this is something that can add tremendous value to your project because that will tell you what is the determinant of selection of these projects uh, and how does China look at it. Because if there's going to be any change in the stance, again, this will be colored, uh, covered in Sino Show's uh, stance towards these projects. So two years from now, if projects in one particular country or a projects of a particular type are not working uh, to China's benefit, two years from now, Sinoshow will change its uh, appetite for these projects. So I think that's why it will give you like a you know, theme to follow. I've been listening to this and I was particularly interested in the financial thing because I heard some of my f 
friends are involved in financing in Africa. And there's a very interesting thing. Most of them have either been excluded or now no longer find it possible to work with Chinese firms. Uh, I do not hold the view that we can in any way give a competition to China. Uh, but I would suggest two lines of uh, inquiry if it can be pursued, uh, particularly in the report as well. Uh, there are two elements which, which uh, are critical, uh, I feel, in terms of improving our performance in Africa. One is on the financing side, certainly. And we have existing modes of financing, but clearly they are not really delivering to the extent uh, they should be. How, how can we improve them, uh, keeping in view what the Chinese have done, what others have done? If that could be an important element in the report, that will be very useful, particularly keeping in view also the investment guarantee element. Uh, the uh, insurance, uh, those are, I think, very critical elements which, which uh, stand in the way of the cost of financing. Uh, is there something that uh, Exim Bank should be doing, which they are not currently doing in terms of mode of financing, etc.? I think it will be very, very important in comparison with other practices to the extent that even regarding the case studies, if you can, if you can draw out something from those other projects and, and come to some conclusion, that will be useful. The second area where, where India, I feel, is particularly strong is on technical cooperation, uh, as well as in terms of affording scholarships and so on. Now, this is not in any way related to our commercial involvement in Africa. I would suggest we need to look at closely if we can make some linkages. Uh, there, are, there are very many training programs that we make. We have also set up institutions in Africa which train people. Now, can they in some ways be related to commercial projects in Africa? Uh, we have African students studying in India. Uh, their internships, can they be spent in Indian commercial projects in Africa during the... Because the cost of training, if you can bring down for Indian companies operating in Africa through these technical cooperation projects, I think is something worth exploring. And if you can even make further technical cooperation projects in line with commercial investments there so that to some extent you discount the cost of investment in Africa. This is something that can be done uh, because we have substantial technical cooperation projects, but to dovetail it with investment. Uh, if, if, for example, uh, there is a new industrial estate coming up in Kenya or elsewhere, can we set up an ITI right there? Uh, with Indian, in, but that can be done through technical cooperation. That that will assist training of uh, people, welders, cutters, what have you, skilled people, who can then be used for investments in those industrial estates. This is this is an element that can be looked at. Thank you. I think there's an interesting point that Ambassador Shishadri said. You know. That's with the capacity building initiatives and how do you link up with uh, the projects that is happening. When we look at India and, uh, as far as, uh, as approach is concerned, uh, we have always worked through our strengths and experiences. Uh, what I think uh, important is the skill development, which in your presentation you did uh, touch upon saying they only prefer certain kind of local skills that they adopt. But uh, if you look at uh, some of our projects, uh, let's say Tata in Mozambique, in Akul, what they have done is that they are also uh, involved them in training programs, sending them back to Dehradun, getting training here and going back. So uh, how to make our, uh, it's a kind of a learning process for us, how to make our uh, ITEC and other 
training programs relevant to the priorities and skills that now Africa requires in terms of their growing economy. That is what we were, we are not uh, making a study and assessment and which is, which uh, firmly I also uh, try to say it in very forums that it's time to look at the kind of skills that we are providing which India is doing. Is it relevant to their local economy or not? So this is one thing that uh, we need to look at. Second, as far as approaches is concerned, when we took a larger picture, India-China approach remains similar in the South-South framework. Modalities are very different. Uh, um, but uh, um, when we look of our projects uh, in, uh, in uh, Africa, uh, you also mentioned about, uh, you know, invest, uh, all these Chinese construction projects, whether they're related to any investments or not. When we look at our Exim Bank projects uh, being a stepping stone for our private sector getting into Africa, we have also seen a very mixed result. Not everywhere it has come up to, uh, has been the success story, where in part of Eastern Africa, if you say Tanzania, Kenya, this has hold good, but if you look at in other parts of uh, country where our Exim Bank projects are, it has not led to bringing more uh, uh, Af Indian FDI over there in Africa. For example, but there are mixed things. If you look at Nigeria and less Angola, you find uh, Indian uh, FDI is going there beyond, beside, without uh, the Exim Bank. It's only in the eastern part of eastern southern Africa where you have Exim Bank related to the FDI is going. So uh, it's uh, even that aspect, our uh, projects has not uh, benefited uh, in, in terms of uh, our private sector investments going to uh, Africa. So this is also one area where we look at. And uh, when I look at uh, um, approaches in terms of development sectors that we are looking now at with Africa, not in other sectors as well, uh, I find that uh, we are doing a lot in Africa. Every time we are pitted against saying, well, Chinese influence is much more than what. What we are not doing more is basically trying to make an impact assessment about our projects, how it is trying to transform livelihoods there, how it is trying to bring down growth structures over there. And it's time that research should be done. We leave everything to government. I don't think that is possible. It's important that more uh, research should be done by the research institutes in India and Africa and, uh, and countries concerned to do a more of impact assessment studies vis a -vis our projects in Africa to see whether it has led to certain. Yes, in case of Ethiopia, we have seen done some studies to see how it is related to transform livelihoods over there, particularly the sugar industry. In case of and what our rural uh, electrification project in in uh, in uh, Ethiopia, but I think more and more uh, studies need to see so that we can bring out where we stand vis-a-vis -vis China. Otherwise, always you get a picture that is Chinese influence. India is not doing anything. We are doing substantial things. Yes, please. <coughs> Back. Uh, yes, please. Uh, my name is Sagar. I 
right for international affairs and we have uh, seen that a lot of uh, discussions have been going on about the uh, the projects uh, in Africa but uh, you know the uh, Chinese and Indians companies are very different because Indian companies are run by as a PSU or private sectors and in Chinese companies they don't have any sort of a red tapism and is the uh, uh, contract is government to government or is it through certain bodies and what sort of uh, we all know that Chinese uh, companies do very well because most of their overhead expenditures are really nil and uh, they can start the work because mostly it is owned by the institutions and their uh, sort of a communist uh, uh, team units so what are the basic things in getting the contract, the mechanism, and as far as the finance is concerned, a lot has been discussed. But the finance part is governed by the Asian Development Bank and other uh, financial institutions of Asia, where Chinese play a very important role. So it is the Chinese investment in Africa which has got little or a frugal investment in the order so how far Chinese companies can get the aid uh, revert back to them is also a very big question because investing without uh, getting the return I suppose it's a, a very murky affair and how far they are getting into this the entire question has to be probed thank you question is how you define returns but no, I just had a query. You know, we discussed about you know, the important role of uh, state in supporting uh, activities of Chinese companies in Africa, especially in Tanzania and Kenya, role of Exim Bank, how you know, most of the projects are actually loan-based rather than coming through FDI-linked investment. Uh, there's another major actor there. Uh, that is Chinese immigrants, those who have migrated, you know, million strong Chinese migrants to Africa. Uh, request, you know, the panel to talk a little bit about uh, what kind of role they're playing in Kenya and Tanzania in driving, uh, you know, Chinese engagement uh, with those, these two specific countries and, you know, more broadly with Africa. There's a whole book, as you know, Howard French's book on uh, China's uh, second continent. So that aspect, if we could discuss a little bit. What we'll do now is that uh, I'll request each of the panelists to take five minutes each to comment on the bigger issues. Uh, don't focus it in your project. We've done enough project with the bigger five thematic issues, which are uh, give us your comments on that. And um, uh, then at the end, I'm going to give a very few general <coughs> remarks on what I believe on other, should be our position on these things, and then we close the session. Yeah, you do that also, but you know, we've had, we, I'd like you to also look at the bigger picture now, not just the, please go ahead. I'll go first. Okay. Um, the Chinese diaspora, so I'll sort of start uh, from the end to the beginning. That was very interesting because some of the contractors that we'd met, uh, they did not even speak English when they had first come to Africa. So they learned English in, uh, like for instance, in Kenya. So some of the gentlemen we spoke to had very heavy Kenyan accents. And it was very interesting because their families grew up there and they had no intention of going back to China. And some of us, some of them told me that, you know, we have a much better quality of life in Kenya. And like, as one mentioned, I have a driver, I have a cook, I have a chef and all of that. But then some of them were also very quick to point out and say that, you know, but I'm going to make sure my kids leave quickly to China to my parents. And you ask them why and they're like, you know, because she's talking Swahili and she doesn't speak any Chinese and, you know, she has to grow up as a Chinese kid. So I think, um, while the Indian diaspora, it's, it's been there for many generations, I think the Chinese diaspora is relatively new on account. And why didn't we um, include the Indian diaspora? Because this was largely a um, report that was trying to understand Chinese, uh, you know, functioning in these two regions. That said, um, Ambassador Kanta had connected me to the high commissions in both Kenya and Tanzania and made it a point to tell me to go, uh, you know, to sh see them first. Um, 
and they immediately connected me to members of the Indian diaspora who were active. So, for instance, they were keeping track of us and sort of helping us through the entire process, from booking us cabs to making sure we were, you know, we were happy and we were safe and all of that. So that support, in, in, in the form of a support system, they sort of uh, existed. Um, they even offered to make me idli and sambar at some point because they thought I would get, uh, you know, I would miss home food. Um, and ma'am, Nivedita ma'am, your question, your point about capacity building, which even Ambassador Sheshadri brought up, um, for the longest time, I know we've talked about capacity building being India's USP, but also I think uh, China has been um, sort of scaling up on that front. There are a lot of Confucius Institute scholarships and also Chinese government scholarships for African students to come study in China. Uh, for instance, when I was a student at Peking University, in my flow, there were students from like Cabo Verde, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, Sudan, and sometimes we'd be sitting in a room and we realized none of us are from the same country. So even Gomera and I met through another African student from Zimbabwe who was a student at Peking University. So the School of Government, for instance, has a lot of officials and bureaucrats who are uh, from different African countries, different ministries, uh, being trained in China. And this was brought up again in a lot of these uh, projects. They told us that you know they do send uh, teams to China for training and back. Um, talking about the larger uh, question, and also, sir, you mentioned uh, Chaudhry, Mr. Chaudhry, you had mentioned that African countries aren't maybe they're not geopolitically uh, too much of a priority for China. I don't know, I would like to sort of push that argument a little bit because, for instance, um, when you look at the BRI, right, I feel like African nations are very important in pushing the narrative of the benign BRI. If you look at the uh, conversations that are coming out of the continent, when there is a pushback from the West or other um, areas about what CPEC means and what BRI could do, um, a lot of African countries have come out and said, no, it's not so bad, it's good, and we welcome it. And also the question of the UNSC vote, uh, the one China policy, pushing the one China policy. I think recently South Oman Princip uh, pulled up, um, like started recognizing Beijing. And I think uh, two weeks later they announced a deep water port there. So I don't know how much, you know, how much that argument would fly. Um, and another thing about um, the Indian... Um, the Indian development model for Africa, right? For instance, the Exim Bank report, which when you read it, it makes sense because they seem to understand where the gap lies, that Indian infrastructure companies have global experience, that they should be active in Africa, they have all these assets in Africa, and how we can further it. The Kukuza development project sort of strongly lays out these are the way forward and we can find ways in which we can cooperate with Chinese actors on the ground. However, when you look at implementation, I don't think so much has happened on that front, and I don't know why that is. Um, and to and there's a Hausa proverb that I keep using in my presentations and I really like. And it says that when the music changes, the dance must too. And I think when it comes to Chinese engagement in Africa, you might like it, you might not like it, you might have strong feelings about it. But the point is they've really changed the rules of engagement in the continent. And they've really provided an alternate uh, model to traditional models. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, let me just mention that... Um, for my um, master dissertation, my topic was to understand uh, what's the impact of uh, debt relief initiatives that was uh, part of the World Bank uh, uh, project to see whether uh, this kind of project has helped uh, African countries so to, like, to have a like, fiscal space and how they can translate the fiscal space into other socioeconomic activities. So finally, it turns out that... Uh, the effect of uh, debt relief was positive, and the impact of debt to, uh, to the growth of the African economy was uh, negatively correlated. So, um, so the issues of debt sustainability, um, like what is now is happening for China, that uh, uh, there's a lot of uh, outside uh, comments about the China uh, debt sustainability and Africa. So I think this all goes back to what uh, the World Bank did last time. So I think as much as China is also trying to, uh, to, 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 to help Africa in terms of financing a long-term project, because uh, most of the long-term projects are more, they're more risky and, and more uncertain. So financing this project um, is, 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 is a part of the 
like uh, how we can, uh, like African agencies, they can take part in, in that process, how they can equip themselves, like most of the African countries, how they can equip them, themselves in order to at least to accrue the benefit of this uh, large or mega infrastructure project. But in looking at the political economy aspect, most of African countries are democratic uh, countries, uh, so to say. So um, issues of politics cannot be separated from the economic perspective. For example, taking back to what Mtwara gas pipeline uh, was uh, implemented during that time. So we asked this uh, responsible official for the, for the, for the minister. He was saying, uh, at that time, we were, we were going to the like, next uh, general election. So the project was one of the determining uh, factor on how to evaluate the activities of the government on that time. So the issue of political economy and the role of African agencies is also uh, critical. So this is uh, what I can, I can comment on that. Yeah, I think we raised a lot of really interesting um, questions here, especially when you talk about the not sure if they have different standards with another uh, insurance company. Uh, I think it's really interesting. I never thought about that. So I want to share some uh, facts. Um, it may be helpful for your questions. The first, um, one of the people talking about uh, talking about the data. If Africa, uh, who is the biggest, who is the uh, have loan the most money to Africa? I cannot say the speak for the African because there are 54 countries, but I do. Uh, read the report released by the Kenya government. Actually, for Kenya, even we have this report in 8 billion SGR projects, but the biggest loaner is not China. It's uh, Africa Bank, uh, AFDB, and the World Bank. China is the third one. Um, that's the fact I want to share. And another thing, uh, I think one of you guys uh, talking about the entrepreneur. So actually from the report we can see released on 2017. So they, they, say, they claim um, the, in, in Africa, the more Chinese private company than um, state-owned company. I won't say I disagree with them, but I think they are a little bit rushed to the conclusion because we don't have exactly number how many SOE and how many private company in, in Africa. But uh, there, there is a thing, just like when Chinese companies, state own company, for example, like CCCC, they prefer use the uh, suppliers they use in China. Uh, then the suppliers in China, they realize that there is an opportunity in Africa, and then they can come to Africa, and they are a private company. So I think it might choose the more private Chinese companies in Africa, because the state-owned company only one, but they may have like 10 private company suppliers back of them. So that's the second fact I want to share. And the third thing, we talk about the cement companies. Um, actually, I have um, meeting many Chinese entrepreneurs too. Uh, they share the same problem. For example, like um, the first, they are doing the trade in Africa, and they realize the uh, uh, like Kenya government may have a better manufacturing policy. If I build a plant here, I may make more money. It's profitable, driven to make them okay. I set a factory here and I manufacture luggage. Just say that, and then I realize the market is uh, is 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 like lim limited. There are only forty million population here. They only need this kind of the luggage. Even I manufacture more, I can now make more money. So that's the problem uh, we are talking about the same thing. So the Kenya, the home markets, they only need this kind of, this amount of the cement, but there are more than 25 cement companies in this market. That's why they are going to, they are, they are, they are dying. That's the first thing. And the second thing, uh, I have interviewed this biggest cinnamon companies, which is a Kenya-owned um, companies. Um, he shared with me, like, the cement is still very raw material in construction. They prefer to sell the concrete. But the Chinese, they think the, they make the concrete better than local. That's why they only purchase cement from local, but they still make their concrete by themselves by using this cement. So that's also the different perspective, but this is different perspective. 
because the Chinese companies think the local cannot make quality enough concrete for them, but the local think they are ready. It's also the, the mace perspective. Yeah, that's what I want to say. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to, before we end, make a few general remarks. Um, Pramit, the, the point you made about the Chinese now wanting international banks and institutions to be a much greater part of BRI. I think had the Chinese gone about the BRI in a sensible way, if you look at the basic white paper of March 2015, that was the intention from the very beginning. But they went about it like a bull in a china shop. And either you do it my way or I'm not. And so no, the problem is they've now committed so many mistakes in addition to whatever good things they've done. And in so far as Africa is concerned, I think I said before you came, these mistakes have been acknowledged, of course, not in so many words, but in terms of the changes required in the FOCAC decisions of September last year. And they very clearly elaborated over there. As I said earlier, it's a question of how they are implemented. We'll see how that happens. Uh, because BRI cannot proceed in the manner it which was intended without third party involvement and third country financing. China can simply not finance it. It's as simple as that. So we must understand that. The, so far as Africa is concerned, Africa is now formally on board on BRI. This was also agreed in the FOCAC documents. And we will see actually how in the BRI summit, which is going to happen in Beijing soon, how actual changes will take place in terms of policies, financing, technology transfers, skilling, etc. I think it will all get spelled out. We'll see how that, that one goes. Now, as far as the themes for today's roundtable are concerned, you know, I think India's approach to Africa influences the China factor. Look, obviously every big country influences every other big country. But India's engagement with Africa is far older than China's engagement with Africa, even on economic and uh, other aspects. The only major Chinese involvement in the 60s was the Tazara Railway, which was a disaster. And it was built for the wrong reasons. When I was posted in Dar es Salaam, the Tazara stations were always empty. There was no train there. So, you know, but China had learned from those mistakes. So I, I, don't, I have never seen, as a person who handled the policy aspect, are being particularly influenced by the China factor. We are in two different realms in Africa. And there is enough space in Africa for us all to be there. And I said in my earlier remarks also, the biggest advantage for Africa is that it now has alternatives. It has China, it has India, it has Turkey, it has uh, Russia, it has Brazil, it has other countries. So I think it, today, the situation for African countries is much better than it was 20, 25 years ago. They have alternatives to look at. And there again, I think, as Ravi said, cost and delivery becomes very important. And from our perspective, the most important thing is do our projects, or do our development cooperation suggestions fit in with local requirements and plans? That has been our bottom line and will remain our bottom line. I think I've covered the question of China's engagement to Africa versus the rest. I think, uh, yes, I think Pramit also mentioned it, others have also mentioned it. The, the traditional donors are not happy with the competition. Why would they be? And I think this is the reality. The traditional donors have to change their ways. I mean, if the World Bank is going to change its ways and the IMF is going to change its ways, they also have to change their ways. Why does everybody have to go and adhere to DSE norms. There is a new norm setting underway, and that is part of the whole process of change. And this new norm setting is what is critical now. Today, we look, we've been talking about South-South cooperation for 50 plus years. It didn't work in the past because the oil producing countries did not contribute anything to the, to the South. Today, the South, non-oil producing South, has, has enormous resources at its disposal. I mean, enormous in inverted commas because obviously it's not as much as we would like it to be. But on top of that, you know how the oil producing countries were joining the southern bandwagon. They're not investing all their money in the West in financial institutions. They're now putting money in projects. All these big oil producing countries now have d development funds which are now investing very wisely. So there is more option for not just Africa but for everybody else. And I think that's a good thing. And so the norms will change. Rule setting will change. And we have to be part of that process of norm setting. Experience of Indian corporates, I think this is uh, 
as I said, next time if you have a broader participation by industry, that would be helpful. But I think the important thing is, I said it earlier also, there is a time will come sooner rather than later, I think, when Indian and Chinese companies will start collaborating more and more in, as, as partners in, in African projects. Not simply uh, as part of multilateral financing, but in terms of tendering for local projects, because there are capacities available. You have now Indian companies which have become African com companies, and so too Chinese companies. I see this happening much more among Chinese private companies and Indian companies than investments coming from or projects being undertaken by Chinese SOEs. But their whole decision-making process is different. So I'll, I'll stop at that, and I think uh, I'd only like to thank all of you for a very interesting discussion. I think we've had a essentially, uh, yeah, no, that, I'm coming, that is his part now. <laughs> I'm finishing my part of it. So we've had a very interesting and I think positive discussion, which I'm very happy to see. And I and again want to congratulate uh, the authors for beginning work on a very interesting and very important project. I think uh, may you have more strength to your elbow and do much more of this work. Next time I would say to you, do it country-wise. Either you do East African community as a whole, not just do Tanzania and, and, and Kenya, or do it country-wise because you'll find that more, more profitable in terms of outcomes. And my recommendation, final recommendation again to is do not have conclusions, have recommendations. Not just for what is happening on the ground, but also in terms of future work. Because you know, then you, you are being positive because, see, I don't think the objective of this report was to be negative of this study. So we, we are not here to, to further strengthen existing narratives which are perhaps negative. You have to look at this in the context of a broader South-South cooperation process. Because unless you do that, there is obviously competition. It's not easy to, 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 to divorce the two. But you know, we have to build this South-South na narrative because the South today has the ability to do things it did not have even 10 years ago. Okay? So we have to now learn from our uh, experiences I was going to say mistakes, but <laughs> experiences, and, and take it forward. So it remains for me to thank you all for a very fascinating discussion, and to Ashok for inviting me to chair this session. My part of the session is now concluded. Over to you, Sanjay. Thank you, sir. Uh, let me uh, at the outset state that uh, it's a very bold and courageous of all the three uh, authors to open up to public scrutiny of their research work. <laughs> It's not easy, and uh, I would say that you should take the suggestions with a pinch of salt, or sometimes a fistful of salt. Why? Because uh, we come up with our own different approaches and our own training. I'm a political scientist, so I'll ask you when I look at the connectivity projects that you're looking at, like a political scientist, I'll ask, are Chinese preferring certain ethnic communities in a given country when they're operationalizing connectivity projects? Uh, that is an important question. Uh, how, how are these connectivity projects impacting ethnic relations in a given country? Because African countries are multi-ethnic countries. But as a political scientist, that is a question that I'll ask. For that, you have to become an expert in ethnic politics of Tanzania and Kenya. And it will take, I mean, if you take all these suggestions, some of times it may take you five to ten years, and probably you need to get a contract for five to ten years of work, uh, which is good. But point is, uh, there is a menu of suggestions that have come. You can pick and choose from those things. The second point again is uh, uh, <clears throat> there has been a lot of response that I noted on the econometric equation that you have placed on the table. Uh, except for the exception of one or two people here, uh, none of us cannot even read that econometric equation. Uh, so our response to your equation has been a general criticism of econometric modeling itself. Uh, so there are two ways when a model is placed on the table you respond. One is, is the, your work consistent within the model? Or the second way of looking at it is critiquing the model itself. So what you have been given is critiquing the model itself. So if you want somebody to comment on the econometric equation that you have placed on the table, we are the wrong audience. Uh, in a way, we are also right because we also help you look at the model from a macro perspective. So probably you need to check it with some econometric uh, uh, experts on that. One of the things that comes, uh, the challenges that you have endured, I can understand, fully understand. For instance, uh, 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 what are the consequences of connectivity spread over a period, period of time? Uh, I wanted to do the same thing to one of the Indian neighbors, and uh, I realized uh, that they don't have census data. So how do you go about it? Uh, 
so I wanted to do a socio-economic impact of connectivity projects in Indian neighborhood. There is no census data. There is no HDA indicators. So how do I study? So you need to come up with proxy variables to look at it. And that's where the suggestions that you got today will help you a lot with a series. I mean, the large menu of proxy variables were suggested. Uh, and uh, the challenges that, that you might have endured, I can fully empathize. Uh, in my instance, the boundaries of the data changes. The districts were reconstituted. The territorial, provincial territory, territories were reconstituted. So all these things uh, you will have to deal with. One of the other things that I noticed uh, during the discussion was the discussion on how is China approaching profit uh, through investments. That is a very interesting dynamic that I noticed. Uh, for instance, Gumera and others, and uh, all of you have suggested that probably uh, they are not taking a project-oriented approach. They are looking more in terms of making a presence felt in their market and having a long-term stay and therefore benefiting from the long-term economic engagement. It requires uh, sustained state support with the Chinese companies are receiving. But as Pramit pointed out, that probably that is also falling apart in the sense that uh, uh, he pointed out that... Uh, <coughs> sorry. He pointed out that uh, uh, the China may be considering... Uh, abandoning certain projects. So uh, this whole issue of profitability requires uh, uh, far, greater, far detailed study. And uh, as uh, uh, Ravi uh, was pointing out, uh, Mr. Butaling, uh, in terms of financing, there is a need for developing a marketplace of models, as he pointed out, a restaurant menu kind of approach to understanding what are the best finance models that are available and countries can pick and choose. And of course, other issues such as uh, capacity building and India's technical cooperation and making it locally relevant, all these issues were touched upon. The issue of di diaspora uh, was also mentioned. Uh, uh, and uh, there are questions there. Uh, uh, to, f to what extent and to with, gr with what intensity should we engage a diaspora in economic activities given the ethnic politics that are there in those countries? Uh, that is something that can be uh, reflected upon. But at a larger level, uh, <coughs> it is interesting that uh, uh, the study is about an Indian perspective, which means that we have co-opted Gomera and Tongu into an Indian perspective. Or the other way of looking at it is probably we have joined your perspective and calling it an Indian perspective. That's another way of looking at it. Uh, and the title says uh, Chinese engagement, uh, whether it is economic, political, cultural, probably there is a need for subtitle there that can be reflected upon. But coming back to this, look at this, uh, 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 an, an, an Indian, a Chinese, and a Tanzanian are looking at Chinese data and uh, data from Africa and trying to give an Indian perspective or one perspective. It's a significant challenge uh, that we are looking at. And those of you who had any doubts about uh, globalization, uh, you can put them to sleep and join us for a sumptuous lunch. Over to you, brother. Thank you. Um, I would request you all to bear with me because this is going to be slightly long. Um, because, uh, like he said, we've had to navigate a couple of hoops uh, to put this together. Um, so to begin with, when... You know, as researchers, Africa isn't probably the hot topic you want to study in India. So when you try and pitch a project and you say you want to study Africa, you want to study Chinese actors, and you want Chinese researchers on board and African researchers on board, and you want to go in the field and you want to do field work and you want to do all of this within one year, not everyone will say, yeah, sure, go ahead. But ICS did. So I think I should start my vote of thanks by thanking Patricia Ma'am, Mohanty Sir, um, a lot of the senior faculty who are here, um, adjunct fellows, honorary fellows in ICS, who were from the get-go thought that this was a great idea and I should just keep going ahead. And especially I'd like to thank Ambassador Kanda. Mm. And I'm not saying this because he's here. Like even before I joined ICS, I told him this and he really was like from the get-go, from getting me connected to missions, making sure I was safe when I was in the field, to pulling strings when Gomera couldn't get his visa. He's been throughout. He's been a constant presence. So thank you, sir. Um, this is for an ICS. If you know ICS, it's a small team, and it's really been all hands on deck. Uh, Madhurima Nandi, our assistant director, was very helpful in navigating the administrative tasks. Sharing uh, helped print, uh, make the program, and design it. Our young uh, colleague, Prarthana, designed the banner. Um, so thank you to all the ICS colleagues. Gunjan, who's here, thank you. Um, NMML, we're very easy co-hosts. Uh, Sanjay, thank you, but also big thank you to Shakti, sir. I presented, after I moved to Delhi, my first presentation on my PhD findings was in this exact room. 
uh, Shakti sir invited me to the Mandela Dialogue. So thank you very much for having us here again. Um, the admin team in ICS and in NMML were very uh, critical in putting all of these things in under 48 hours together. Very efficient team, so thanks to them. I'd also like to thank our partners in Africa, Sais Boto, who navigated the fieldwork in Kenya, and also Repowa in Tanzania. Um, Isaac Fukuo and Dr. Donald Mari, very helpful throughout the entire process. I'd also like to thank, I don't need to, I know, but I still need to thank you guys, because I have been, I've given them really hard timelines. Um, I, when it came to writing, we had interviews at 7 in the morning, 11 p.m. Not once did these guys complain. We went back to back at it, so thank you very much. I'd also like to just thank our research assistant, Sunaina Uday. They made sure that before we went into every interview, we got company briefs that told us everything that is on the open source about that company, so we walked in informed, semi-informed. And also with writing of the report, they've taken huge chunks of the report and they've written it, so thanks to them. And most importantly, like you can see in the study, our focus wasn't on Indian stakeholders. So the reason we wanted this, because for this entire one year, these projects existed in our heads. We've had many heated debates about a lot of these things. We wanted to sort of share it with people and sort of get a sense of where we were going with it. And I'm not saying this because, again, I have to, but a lot of what came out of today's discussions is going to inform the final report. So thank you all very much. I know you all have bet, I mean, you're all very busy people, but thank you for taking the time. Thank you for showing the patience, and thank you for uh, sharing with us your comments and insights. It's made the report much better. Thank you. Please join us for lunch. <laughs>